Can everybody hear me? Yep. 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 Let's give this a shot. I have a microphone um, next to my laptop so we can make sure that, that, that the audio is picked up. Okay. I will call the May 7th, 2020 regular Des Moines City Council meeting to order. Will Council Member Nutting please lead us in the pledge? Hear you. Council Member Nutting, did you hear me? I pledge allegiance. Yep, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, under God, under God, under God invisible, 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 with liberty and, liberty and justice, justice for all. Justice for all. <laughs> Okay, that was kind of awkward. Thank you. The uh, delay made that a little bit of a challenge, but it worked. I appreciate it. Uh, so let the record show that all council members are present. Um, I have a, a few opening remarks. Uh, tonight's meeting is once again a virtual meeting. The agenda has been limited to uh, limited as a result of the governor's order suspending portions of the Open Public Meeting, Meetings Act, and you will see that items eight and nine on the consent calendar have been removed. I wanna thank our city clerk and IT staff for working to improve our technical capabilities in order to allow for the video conferencing of council members, as well as adding the system functionality that enables the public to interact virtually. Thinking back to February and March, no one really anticipated that we'd still be holding council meetings entirely through virtual means. As a city, we didn't have much experience with this, as there hadn't been the need. I want to thank our staff for doing all the legwork during this challenging time to make this happen. There are two main tasks that the city faces at this time. I'd like to describe them. The first is the emergency management response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is being accomplished by our emergency management efforts, and we will hear more about that later. I do want to note that in Des Moines, our mortality rate of deaths to confirm infections is less than 1%. This compares to the national average of about 6%. However, I think we would all agree that any loss is just too much. And our hearts go out to those who have lost a loved one to this devastating virus. It's also important to note that no one can take credit for having a low mortality rate. However, I believe we can say that without the collaborative efforts of our emergency operations center, and the excellent responses from South King Fire and Rescue, the Des Moines Police Department, the city staff, and the many of our citizens who are paying attention to social distancing and the stay at home, stay healthy program, the number of mortalities could be higher. The strength of our community is illustrated by our citizens holding onto protocol and abiding by the governor's stay at home order and doing their part to be safe and keep others safe. So for doing your part, we say thank you. The second major challenge we face as a city is avoiding bankruptcy. Many other cities are concerned about facing this real possibility. We are solvent and financially strong with appropriate financial contingencies in place to weather the unknown and these uncharted waters. Many of our council members were on the council as we faced the challenge of bankruptcy in the past. We did not succumb, but we emerged stronger. Those efforts and learnings are now of great value as we move forward, understanding that fiscal discipline is the key to financial safety. Our city manager is away tonight. However, the team he has brought together is one of the finest and most talented in the region, and many of them are with us tonight. It wasn't easy to assemble this group, but when these individuals saw this, what the city was accomplishing, they made the choice to join our team. Many took a pay cut when they came on board, believing that when the city had advanced, that they would be able to recoup the reduction. As the city progressed, so did their compensation. It got adjusted to an amount that was commensurate with their talent and their market worth. 
It is because of Michael's leadership that he was able to assemble, assemble such a top-notch team. And it's because of the team and their collective expertise that we are now moving forward in the safest possible direction. I'm grateful for all the talented individuals that we have working for, with us and for our city. And I felt it was important at this time to say thank you. Is there any correspondence? Yes, Mayor, we've received several since last meeting. I'll read the name and the subject into the record. Marnie Savoris, ban on late fees. Christina Cutler, comments on halting late fee on rent. Jerry Buxton, address to Mayor of Des Moines. Tim Cutler, sidewalk extension. Esther Miller, COVID-19 relief for Des Moines businesses and res residents. Henry McMichael, these proposals on the blog. Rob Anderson, Councilmember Martinelli's blog proposal. Henry Stahl, public comment for May 7th, 2020 City Council meeting regarding planned expenditures. And Riley Bancroft, who is going to speak for public comment tonight. And a letter from Kevin Isherwood offering $5,000 in financial support of the EATS program to assist feeding citizens while concurrently supporting Des Moines local businesses and that concludes correspondence and these will be uploaded to the packet and on the website tomorrow. Thank you very much. So at this point we are moving forward to comments from the public. We will take comments uh, from the public and they'll be done via Zoom. Those wishing to speak will need to make needed to make arrangements with the city clerk prior to the start of the meeting. I believe uh, this, this is a new protocol for us. Um, will I be calling their name or will the city clerk be calling out the name? It, it works for okay, so the, call the city clerk will call your name and your session will be unmuted. Please state your name and the name of the city in which you live and you will have three minutes to speak. This time I'll admit Riley Bancroft into the meeting. She's connecting. So she's on, if you want to let Riley know. Riley, are, are you out there? Hi. Yes, I am. Okay, the floor is um, yours. My name is Riley Bancroft. I live in the city of Des Moines, and I wanted to make... Oh. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Riley, are you still there? Uh, we can hear you very well. I would ask anyone who is not speaking to please mute their line. It is creating a okay. bit of feedback uh, and it will that. help. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I wanted to make a, co a comment regarding um, agenda item number seven, uh, the motion to award the city of Des Moines um, city custodial services contract to a new service provider. Um, as a resident of Des Moines, I'd like to raise attention to the increase of expenditure for the city custodial services. It is my understanding that the current service provider has been the successful bidder for these custodial services since 2003 and is a resident and small business owner in the city. The current contractor's bid for this goods and services contracted is an estimated annual amount not to exceed $144,452 or $144,452. Um, I'd like the city council to be aware that the motion to award the contract equals an excess of $108,624,000 annually, which equates to a total of $389,236 over the course of the 43 month contract. Um, please note that these contract values are based on identical scopes of work. Given the current economic climate, um, I'm just hoping that there will be further discussion 
and would greatly appreciate any discretionary review before the motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Amber is up next and I'm admitting her right now to the meeting. Amber, are you out there? She's connecting. Oh, she's connecting, okay. Amber, do we have you? Still connecting. Okay, still connecting. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Amber, we can hear you. Hi, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. The floor Amber, is yours. Amber Camille for Des Moines. Hello, Council and staff. Thank you for your time. I don't have much to say. Other than I wish the city would do more to help its people during this pandemic. I've seen, it seems we've done. Yes, I can. Sorry. It seems we've done almost nothing until very recently with some small targeted, targeted initiatives. The council even took a month off. And for those who say we have to be fiscally responsible, it shouldn't and shouldn't spend money to help our residents. That is how we, that, that's not how we should operate, especially during an emergency. Our neighboring cities and cities that have similar budgets to ours are doing so much more than us. Please think of the people and do more to help the residents and businesses. Things like the EOC are great, but it's not enough. Thank you. And that's all for now. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our public comment. So we will move forward to the administration report. As I mentioned, uh, City Manager Michael Mathias is not here tonight. So I will ask Chief Operations Officer Dan Brewer to give his report. Thank you, Mayor. Um, good evening, Council. Um, we have a number of uh, reports that we relative to our response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have a PowerPoint that we've put together that we uh, will uh, work through a number of the staff are prepared to uh, present as part of this um, update. And um, the theme that we have in, um, developed uh, in response to this pandemic is survive, revive, and thrive. It's important that we, we do these three things as individuals, as a community, and as a corporation, as a city business. And I think that you'll see uh, through the course of this presentation that that we are hitting on all of these marks. So, so with that, I'd like to um, uh, invite uh, Dave Metafton, Assistant Fire Chief, who's gonna provide us with a, an update on our emergency management operations at the ELC. Dave, are you there? Hello. Hello. Can anybody hear me? We guess we, we can, can hear you. Dave. Okay, I, I'm. I'm not. I, I'm not accustomed to Zoom, so I apologize. I'm. I'm running on a cell phone, and I'm also got you online. So we'll see. As long as the feedback isn't bad, I won't screw with anything. <laughs> um. So the EOC uh, is located at Station 67 in Des Moines. Um, and it's a jointly operated endeavor between the city and the fire department. <clears throat> we have, in a very short period of time, managed to turn a concept between uh, the city and the fire department into a reality. And it's operating currently two days a week, and it's adjustable as necessary uh, for us 
with COVID, us being the fire department, we have a number of challenges, uh, both internally and externally. One of the largest pressures that we're seeing uh, as an ongoing problem is just the supply and then resupply of personal protective equipment for our staff. Um, the number of calls, fortunately, are slowing, uh, specific to COVID-19. However, the, the daily requests for service continue. Um, and we have found that through the EOC, a much closer collaboration with the police department and other agencies or other entities within the city, I'm sorry, uh, departments, I guess. Um, the coordination and communication is much better than it ever has been, at least in the time that I've been in the department. So um, there's an awful lot of uh, good that's coming out of the COC. Uh, one of the things that's coming up now is the discussions about what we're going to do with the 4th of July. Uh, the COC will serve us all well in that setting uh, because we simply don't know what the 4th of July is going to bring with regard to weather and all the pressures that people are under right now. Uh, falling on a weekend, I suspect that it's going to be a busier than normal um, holiday, and we want to be ready to address any concerns um, that come with that. So um, I guess in a nutshell, I would say that uh, the EOC is a reality and it's working quite well. And um, I'm pretty happy that we're where we're at with it right now. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, Dave, um, one of the things I wanted to add um, is that we uh, formed the council that we have been um, Having regular briefings uh, between the EOC, our, our department directors, um, and that's that's operating very well, and couldn't be happier with how the EOC is working. Before I uh, ask Shannon to come up, Dave, uh, appreciate you being here tonight, and I have something to say to you on the record. In February, as the outbreak of this COVID nineteen uh, pandemic was beginning to impact Washington State and specifically King County, I was very skeptical of many of the things that you were telling us. I was openly critical about some of the information you were suggesting at that time. And I want you to know I was wrong. Everything you told us at that time about the potential for this virus has turned out to be spot on. So I want to thank you for your dedication and your service to this community. We are blessed to have a professional like you looking out for our citizens. So thank you. So at this time, I'd like to have uh, Shannon. Uh, um, and she's going to give us an update um, um, about some of the things that she's been working on through the EOC. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Shannon Kirchberg, Emergency Preparedness Manager for the City of Des Moines. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update on some of our local partnerships. Um, I have to say that the partnership with South King Fire, uh, the mentorship that I have been receiving from Vic Pennington, Dave Metafton, and Shane Smith has been amazing. Um, we have all learned so much from South King Fire and I cannot thank them enough for their leadership and partnership through um, this incredibly difficult time. I also wanted to uh, put a formal thank you out to Ray Gross, the emergency manager for the city of Federal Way. Um, he has been there for me um, and for the EOC. Uh, every step of the way, he's included me in uh, communications with their uh, emergency response team, included me in communications, forwarded information. Um, he has been amazing in uh, making sure that the city of Des Moines and the city of Federal Way are in lockstep going through this pandemic. In addition to that, Will Lugo uh, with the city of SeaTac, um, the same, has uh, 
kept us in the loop with what CTAC is going, has going on in their city, um, sending me policies, sending us procedures that they've come up with, um, and just the constant uh, seamless communication has been unbelievable. Uh, King County EOC, the entire staff with their um, daily calls seven days a week, every day at 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, they are there timely with updated information, um, new hot sheets for us to share with our community, um, additional information to load up on our uh, website of which Bonnie Wilkins has been amazing in loading two times a day for us to make sure our citizens are up to date and have all of the information um, that is going on with this pandemic. Sarah Miller, Zone 3 FEMA coordinator, um, has been incredible in answering all of our questions um, and helping keep us organized. Um, another partnership that we have been working very hard on was, has been with our Des Moines Area Food Bank. Um, the city of Des Moines, uh, with the partnership and the EOC, we've been reaching out to the food bank weekly. Um, Rochelle from Human Services and I uh, connect with them individually each week, um, usually on Tuesday or Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we have started showing up with six city staff members to help the food bank unload their weekly food order that comes from Food Lifeline out of Soto. Uh, we're rotating this through the police department, community development, park maintenance, and parks and recreation each week. Um, each department um, shows up when the truck shows up. We get it offloaded and into the food bank and stocked on the shelves as directed by uh, the amazing staff at the food bank. Um, we were able to connect a partnership with the food bank and Highline Schools, the food bank with all the commodities that they've been getting from the government to help with the farmers uh, with all of their extra produce, milk, cheese of the like because of the close downs of the hotels and restaurants. They've been getting a lot of um, commodities that require refrigeration. So we were able to connect the food bank with Highline Schools. Since the schools are out of session, um, they have a extra refrigeration and freezers that they were able to accommodate the food bank to store some of their supplies that they couldn't handle. Uh, the city has committed 3,000 face masks. Um, to the food bank. Uh, we delivered 500 two weeks ago, another 500 yesterday. I don't want to overwhelm them with all 3,000 because their um, uh, availability of storage is not the greatest. So I'm hanging on to the balance. We have it at the city and they know that they can call me at any time, regardless of the day, regardless of the time, and I will bring them more face masks or resource whatever needs they may have. Um, speaking of PPE, we have been extremely lucky at the city of Des Moines. Uh, I wanted to give huge recognition to Patty Richards with Des Moines Police Department because of the H1N1 um, incident. Patty was brilliant with forethought and stocked up our city with, eight, uh, with face masks and gloves. Um, and N95 masks. So we have been very lucky um, with our PPE in the very beginning for our first responders. Um, also South King Fire um, backing us up all along the way. Um, we have a good supply of gloves, disposable masks, cloth masks that were donated to us from King County EOC. We have some N95 masks for our essential staff um, hand sanitizer, which we've had to move to the liquid because the gel is just impossible to find. Um, and then thanks to South King Fire, we have a 55 gallon of uh, Santa Sit Spray um, disinfectant to wipe down all of our high touch areas. We have also deep cleaned all of our buildings in the city of Des Moines that we have staff entering and exiting um, daily. Um, these buildings are have been sanitized. The only buildings that we have not sanitized as of yet are the Beach Park Event Center facilities, and this is because these buildings are not in use. This will be done and conducted as soon as rentals are allowed to take place. Safety is our number one priority, not only for our staff, but also the public. We are preparing a back-to-work plan for our staff. 
um, as well as putting together checklists to make sure that our buildings are safe for staff and public when we open up hopefully in June. And those operating procedures hopefully will be done within the next couple of weeks um, for the staff to review. End of report. Okay. Thank you, Shan uh, Shannon. I want to add uh, some clar uh, clarity to one particular issue that you were talking to, and that's the um, the PPE that we have available. Uh, yeah, you're you're right. In um, some of the the previous work that the PD had done to make sure that our first responders had adequate equipment, as this uh, pandemic has progressed over the last several week uh, weeks and months. Uh, PPE was in a uh, critical state to the point that we only had PPE available for first responders. Uh, many of our other staff uh, did not have PPE. It was reserved specifically for our fire and PD personnel. It's only been in the last couple of weeks as the supply chain around the country has caught up to or is catching up to the demand for PPE that we've been able to now make some of those masks available to the, the food bank. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to do that per, as long as the supply chain uh, can support that. So um, this is a, a, a dynamic situation and uh, in all levels and including the supply chain to support uh, first responders. So I wanted to just add a point of clarification on that. I want to have uh, Susan uh, Cesar, our Chief Strategic Officer, uh, provide uh, some updates on our summer programs. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, good evening, Mayor, City Council. Um, Susan Cesar here. Um, the one thing I wanted to preface this with is that we are operating, as you know, um, with a lot of uncertainty. And so we've made decisions with the information that we have. Um, and this is kind of still a dynamic situation. So things may change, but as of now, um, here's what we know. The summer, as you've heard, the summer concert series, um, we made that decision this week to uh, suspend those concerts for this year. Um, I did want to say thank you to the Arts Commission. They put a great deal of effort into preparing for this, and it was quite disappointing um, to need to cancel that, but it absolutely was the right decision based on the fact that large gatherings are, are not going to be happening this summer. Um, the external agencies events that we normally have, um, one of them is the farmer's market, and we have been working with them. Um, the King County Department of Health has new guidance specifically for farmers markets and they're quite uh, extensive. So the farmers market is hopeful that they can meet those and will be able to open. Um, they will need to have a plan approved by the health department and then they'll be reevaluated weekly to see whether they can open the following week. So um, we'll stay tuned on that and hope, for, hope that they can get that going. Um, the other agency events that we usually have, Destination Des Moines and Rotary. Those decisions, uh, of course, are driven by safety. And uh, as you heard also, Destination Des Moines decided um, to cancel the 4th of July and the Waterland weekend. Um, I understand they're working on a potential virtual uh, parade. And so um, we'll, we may hear more about that later. Um, the private rentals, as you know, we rent out our facilities and uh, a lot of people have events scheduled through the summer still. Um, earlier, we began offering uh, the ability to reschedule or to refund deposits for our customers. And the ones that were kind of still hanging in there, hoping that their events would be able to proceed, we're kind of working with each of those customers individually, looking at how many people, whether social distancing can occur, and making decisions um, as we go. So that's kind of a rolling um, you know, uh, process as we go through the summer, but a great deal of those will need to be rescheduled or uh, canceled. The recreation programs, similarly, we have a lot of constraints around uh, gatherings and programs still. 
um, those programs are going to need to be modified and or suspended. Um, the staff, the recreation staff are looking into expanding some of our virtual programs. You may have seen some of the posts that they've been doing on Facebook. And um, we're, we're also sharing information with other parks and recs departments throughout the state. And everyone's struggling with the same thing. Uh, and we're trying to look at creative ways that we still may be able to have some kind of summer programs. Oh, um, before we move to the senior, just one last comment on the parks. I did want to mention to um, folks that, of course, our parks are still open for local uh, use, but especially reminder that with the nice weather coming this weekend, that social distancing is still necessary in our parks. Thank you. Next slide. Um, the Senior Activity Center, boy, those folks have been very busy. The staff over there, um, you know, with our lunch, hot lunch program, we began that program when we first needed to close the activity center with doing about 23 lunches per day. We are increasing steadily and we're up to between 80 and 90 hot lunches per day and still increasing. Um, so that's been extremely popular. Um, the Meals on Wheels program has seen a similar increase and we are now delivering uh, with the help of volunteers around 400 frozen meals per month. The staff uh, are staying in touch with the seniors. They're giving weekly wellness calls um, and just chatting with the seniors, finding out if they need anything, connecting them to resource. They also are doing um, things just to add a touch of something special to the lunch program uh, and also in other ways. So the holidays we recognize with um, the staff dressing up and uh, for Mother's Day, we're gonna plan to have fresh flowers uh, given out with lunch. They've been sending out birthday and other greeting cards and a lot of the seniors really enjoy getting mail. Um, we also let them know that the counselor that used to be located at the activity center is still available uh, just via, via telephone. And I really want to appreciate the staff, the volunteers, and our partner agencies who have done an absolutely incredible job of keeping up with the ever-increasing demand for services. And just a few pictures to let you show a little bit about the lunch program. On the left is Karna, uh, the cook, and she's the one pumping out those 90 meals per day in the activity center kitchen. Uh, and the middle is some of our seniors arriving for their takeout lunches. And we had the bunny helping out uh, during Easter week. Uh, and they had a kind of a contest to see if anyone could figure out who the bunny was and nobody got it right. And it was actually Kyle Ehlers, our uh, assistant recreation manager. Um, one other piece of good news is that some other work is still occurring. And we had, if you recall, a grant from King County Youth and Amateur Sports. And we wanted to say thank you to Dave, uh, council member, uh, King County Councilmember Dave Upthegrove. Uh, we've completed the work of installing the athletic floor, which is suitable for um, dance. Uh, we have the Seattle Theater Group, which rents that facility every summer. They won't be holding their camp there this year, Ailey Camp. However, um, they'll be back hopefully next year. And the floor is also has more give to it than the concrete uh, and is suitable for other athletic type activities as well. And we think it looks great. Thank you, Dan. All right. I want to have Scott give us an update of uh, some of the things that we're doing down in Redondo uh, in response to uh, the governor uh, uh, press conference that he gave la uh, late last week. And uh, so, Scott, take it away. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, Scott with the Des Moines Marina. Just a real quick update. As we all know, the, uh, the city continues to support the governor's ease and the restrictions on some recreational activities like golfing, uh, different parks, fishing, boating, and all these other things. So on May 5th, Tuesday, the city reopened the Redondo, all the access points to the Redondo beaches on the boardwalk and on the beaches itself. We also opened up the boat ramp and the Redondo restrooms at this time. 
we've opened the parking lot, but until the governor lists the stay at home, stay healthy, uh, we've restricted that parking lot to just vehicle trailer parking only, and we've signed that to reflect that. Uh, the boardwalk itself is doing well. Uh, I get, I think half the people that live down there have my cell phone, so I'm getting my calls about it. And uh, everybody's, it's all been positive and um, it's working well. And I really wanna thank Police Chief Thomas and his entire team for the extra presence there down there. It's greatly appreciated not only by the staff of the Marina, but also those residents down there. And with this warm weather this weekend, I believe it's gonna be another busy place. But that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. All right, um, I wanna, go ahead, Mayor. Um, Council member, there's a question. Would you like to hold those until the very end? It might be easier just for logistics. To do it now? Or do them at the end. Yeah, let's just, we can do them at the end if we can, or it doesn't matter to me, whatever. Um, I guess at this point, I suggest that we, we do them at the end, so it's just, okay. it's simpler to manage. Okay. So I wanna um, let the council know of uh, some things that we're doing as far as economic recovery for the community. Um, we've assigned some dedicated staff resource. Eric Lane is a city planner. Uh, he's been with us for a while now. He pre came to us from uh, Pierce County Housing Authority and he, is a, he does some part-time uh, guest lecturing at uh, Highline College. Um, and he's gonna be focusing on economic relief and uh, as a, uh, resource coordination. Um, this position will uh, help to seek resources and, and provide uh, referrals to our local businesses to help uh, the economy recover from this pandemic. Um, it'll also uh, be working uh, at the state and federal level with, our, with Anthony uh, Hempstead, our leg legislative advocate, to secure any available state or uh, federal resources for local businesses that become available. Um, Eric has already been uh, coordinating with a number of groups and organization, uh, GSP, SBDC, uh, the Soundside Alliance, uh, Southside Chamber of Commerce, Association of Washington City, Suburban Cities Association. He's also been working with King County Metro um, as well as the Port of Seattle um, in coordinating benefits, um, potential resources for businesses in Des Moines. Um, one of the things that Eric will continue to do as well is to coordinate with Shannon through the EOC um, as additional uh, economic resources may be coming available through the federal government. Uh, we'll be able to uh, help local businesses um, uh, getting access to uh, that information so that they can get um, uh, the resources they need uh, in the recovery efforts. Okay, I wanna talk for a minute about a new program um, that's been developed here. It's, uh, the acronym is called EATS. It's an emergency assistance to seniors and, and vets program. Um, you know, given the success that Susan was talking about a few minutes ago at the senior center, where we've got an increasing amount of meals that we've been serving um, and a, a good uh, resource for our seniors there, um, we wanted to see if there was ways that we could expand that um, to other, um, other days of the week. Right now we provide those meals on Monday through Friday and so we began to wonder if there was ways that we could try to provide uh, meals to seniors um, and veterans on the weekends, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, so pretty much since the beginning of the outbreak of this pandemic, we've been uh, working uh, to try to figure out how we could inject capital into the local economy. Um, and as well as expanding the services to seniors and vets. And so we also were having some discussions with Leuna, the local 242 uh, Union Hall. Uh, Dave, Dave Bright has been very excited about the potential for this program. 
And uh, Rochelle Sims, um, our, one of our management analysts worked uh, out the details with King, our King County uh, vets and senior uh, levy staff to direct uh, some of our grant funding that we uh, have from them to fund this program. So the EATS program uh, is basically each, each week we uh, provide um, a voucher for $2,500 to a local restaurant. Um, and each week we'll use a different restaurant. And the idea is to do uh, provide local investment into our business communities of about $10,000 a month uh, in support of the local economy. Uh, we reached out to Anthony's as kind of our first restaurant. Uh, Rochelle worked uh, closely with our local uh, restaurant folks and they were really excited to participate in this program. Um, a press release was sent out um, on April 30th and the program began yesterday. And, um, you know, as with any program, uh, we're, we anticipate trying to, and learning from uh, as we get started and finding ways to make the program more effective and more efficient. Um, since we've rolled the program out, we did get um, uh, a letter which was in uh, correspondence to council tonight uh, from Kevin Usherwood donating an additional $5,000 to this effort um, uh, from GEICO uh, military uh, uh, department. And, um, you know, donations to the city are tax deductible and there may be other folks that wanna to contribute to supporting the local economy and our restaurants, as well as our seniors. Uh, this is uh, the letter from Kev, um, uh, from Kevin that was in the council, pa uh, the correspondence that you received earlier this evening. So here's a, um, a copy of the flyer uh, that's been just uh, put, to, put out uh, to the seniors. Uh, the vouchers are distributed to seniors at the senior center, uh, as well as the Laguna 242 Union Hall, um, who will distribute uh, the voucher, uh, restaurant vouchers to the veterans. Um, and so um, the way this works is uh, at the senior center, uh, the seniors will get the voucher and um, they can order ahead on this uh, flyer that there's a couple of meal choices. They can they, uh, make arrangements ahead of time and then they can go to the restaurant and pick up the meal and turn in their voucher. So uh, really nice uh, flyer and each week uh, as we select new restaurants, it will update the flyer uh, with, the, with the menu choices and the information about uh, the restaurant. Um, today was the first day that we handed out the vouchers at the Senior Center and the, uh, the union, uh, to the union um, so that they could distribute those to the veterans. And a very positive um, uh, uh, feedback that we were getting from the seniors and, and the veterans and very, a lot of excitement about the program. And so we're really uh, anxious to see how this works uh, moving forward. Um, on, the, on the EATS program. You know, this uh, program like this, uh, this took a lot of time to put together, a lot of skill and a lot of effort to implement. Um, this was a team effort that, uh, Michael spearheaded uh, city manager Matthias. Um, you know, Michael comes up with great ideas like this one. And then he empowers uh, the staff to deliver it. And wow, Rochelle and Eric sure delivered this one. Um, it's a great example of kind of the synergy, synergistic approach that Michael likes to take um, in terms of serving the community. In this case, um, we can infuse uh, capital into the local economy from outside resources and our seniors and our veterans benefit. So I'm really excited about this program and uh, uh, we look forward to, to seeing how we can potentially expand this if we can in the future, uh, depending on available resources. Um, the last um, update that we have for you tonight, Council, is um, a brief uh, update on the budget. I'm going to ask Beth Ann to uh, provide us uh, 
a snapshot of kind of where we're at with uh, revenue estimates, expenditures, um, and um, our fund uh, fund balances for cash flow purposes. So Beth Ann. Um, good, thank you, Dan. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Beth Ann Rowe, Finance Director. So um, after all the great program information, we're gonna take a shift over to city finances. Um, we're gonna start with some of the challenges to our finances from COVID-19. Um, the main one is our revenue challenges as other um, communities are dealing with it. There's um, as a result of the stay home and stay healthy, there's going to be a decrease in revenues. Um, the first one is our decrease in tax revenues and then also a decrease in program revenues as um, in our parks department we've um, had with the schools closing and having to suspend and modify our programs. We're working at determining the impact to all our significant revenue sources. Um, we we've primarily tonight focused on the general fund. Um, we're exploring and working with our um, emergency preparedness manager on possible funding from FEMA and other state and federal resources to respond to this pandemic. Um, one of our challenges and concerns is timing of our revenue sources. There's a huge uncertainty of when we will receive these resources. Um, and we're facing significant challenges related to the uncertainty in the receipt of the revenues. So in working with the department directors and um, executive management, uh, we've run some scenarios and our initial um, we've looked at revenue losses from the range of 8% to 20%. And for our initial, what we know today, which we know will change as things unfold, we're um, looking at and dealing with approximately about a 16% loss in revenue. So this slide is, how are we um, adjusting expenditures in the general fund to respond to this revenue loss? Now, the first thing is, is our COVID-19 response. We have some additional costs to stand up the EOC, supplies and costs of PPEs, and um, pretty much the things that Shannon went through earlier in the presentation. Right now, a placeholder I've put is 75,000, but as I actually, we get the actual bills and everything, that number, I can guarantee you will change. Um, for the general fund, we're eliminating any transfers out to capital, which is 679,000. Um, also, our Great Arts Commission offered to not use all their funds to assist the city in the response to COVID-19. So we've reduced their budget by 50,000. Um, we've also eliminated transfers to equipment replacement and facility repair and replacement funds for 2020, which is just a little over 400,000. In the police department, um, they're fully staffed. So right now we've suspended the higher head program for 2020. Now, as we know, if there are essential staffing um, issues and whatnot, we may have to revisit that. Um, we have a vacant position in, in legal for the paralegal that's been put on hold. Parks and Rec programs, our initial estimate is $356,200 um, in program expenses. And um, we've laid off our extra hires and part-time staff. Um, and then we have two vacant positions in parks maintenance. So our total adjustments are close to $2.1 million to respond. Yeah, Beth Ann, just really quickly before you move off of this slide, um, I want to make uh, go back to the first point and just make sure that it's perfectly clear that the seventy-five thousand dollars that's shown there is um, a placeholder for additional expenses in the budget um, above and beyond what was already in the adopted budget. That is not even close to representing our total cost. Uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, 
that total cost of response is likely to be in the neighborhood of a million dollars or more. But this is intended to kind of show adjustments to the budget that we are anticipating based on what we know as of 4.55 this afternoon. That's correct. So on the next slide, as the, um, as things unfold, and as we know, Governor Inslee extended the stay home and stay healthy order. So we're looking at additional strategies to address the impacts. There's a standby program, which is a short-term intervention provided by the federal government related to unemployment benefits. We're researching early separation program um, to see if um, we could get savings there. And um, we're also evaluating and holding discretionary expenses, because if we don't need to spend that, we aren't going to. And we're exploring all opportunities for federal and state reimbursements. Now in SCORE, um, the actions taken when we became an owner city during the refinance of the SCORE bonds, and also the withdrawal of City of Federal Way has reduced our share of debt related to SCORE. Um, also, SCORE has taken actions in their operating expenditures in response to COVID-19 to ensure owner cities' contributions stay at the current budgeted amounts. So we won't have to take on any additional expenses, which is good. So for cash flow, um, when we're looking at it, full economic impacts of the virus are not yet clear. We're taking measures to meet our ongoing ob obligations while facing the uncertainty around revenues. And one of the things um, I'm doing is um, we're moving and making sure we're securing and reserving funds for our debt service obligations. So we um, demonstrate that we're meeting all our bond commitments for external um, bondholders so we can maintain our rating. Um, the solution is to maintain a healthy fund balance since no one knows the depth and the length of the COVID economic disruption we'll have. We're hoping that there will be um, a recovery late third quarter, fourth quarter, um, but we'll have to wait and see depending upon what happens with the stay home, stay healthy and how the economy opens. In cash flow, most revenues are cyclical and sensitive to the current economic environment. The good news is 2020 property tax levy was set at the end of 2019. Um, King County uh, extended the first half 2020 property tax deadline filing to June 1st. But the good news is the first half of 2020 property tax receipts are on target. I believe a lot of that is due to people paying into an escrow account for their mortgage. On the next slide, um, our concerns for cash flow and the uncertainty is the second half of 2020 property tax receipts due um, to the COVID-19 impacts to households. Their ability to make mortgage payments during the stay home, stay healthy order may impact that second half of um, property tax receipts. The sales and use taxes, April 2020 for February sales is already down 10% from previous year to date. So as March and April unfold, um, we'll have to monitor each sector to find out um, kind of the impacts there. There's a two month lag in receiving sales tax revenue data from Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue granted extensions to file tax returns which is good for the payee, but does not help us determine the impact of COVID-19 on our tax revenues. So it's gonna be later, probably August, September, um, when we find out um, what that impact is gonna be. And so we'll have to provide some scenarios and um, information during the August budget retreat and discuss some options there. So we, um, our goal is to um, maintain fiscal discipline over our, over our expenditures, 
and um, continue to monitor the um, impact and information as it comes in from COVID-19. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Beth Ann. Uh, I want to point out that um, financial discipline um, the, that the council has put into place over the last several years has really paid off now, um, where we have structural uh, expenditures that are matching um, structural revenues, um, where we have uh, a health, uh, healthy uh, fund balances uh, by the uh, GFOA office, 16.67% uh, uh, specific for cash flow purposes, where we have uh, the disturbances in the timing of revenues. That's exactly why we have um, fund balance uh, minimums that we have established. Um, you know, we we are going to have budget impacts because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. No question about that. But because of the discipline that the council has taken over the last several years, we've been able to make um, some adjustments to our revenue estimates and our expenditures. And um, we're doing okay at the moment. You know, that could change tomorrow. Um, we, we are not having the same kinds of financial uh, stresses that we see some of our other cities around us are having. Um, and that has a lot to do with various types of revenue streams, but it primarily has to do with the financial controls that the, that the council has put in place over the last several years. So that can, uh, as we wrap up our administration report, I appreciate the time you've allowed us to give you an update on what we've been doing. There's been a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of, um, Uncharted waters. This is new for all of us, and um, and uh, it's a dynamic situation. And as we begin to think about uh, reopening and getting back to uh, uh, some kind of business as usual, that business as usual will be different. The reality is, there we are not going back to uh, the way things used to be. It will be business, new business. And how we do that is still uh, unknown at this point. Um, but as we work through that, we will survive, we will revive, and we will thrive. Mayor, that concludes administration report. And I, um, Council Member Bangs had a question, and I don't know if others did, um, but I'd like to give her the opportunity to ask her question at this time. Thank you, Mayor. First, I'd like others to note that down at the bottom of your screen, you are able to use a chat where you can ask the mayor uh, if you can be recognized. So I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's available. Um, I wanna thank uh, Dan and staff for the report uh, given. It was very encouraging, even though this is some crazy timing. Um, I would like to know, and one of the questions was answered related to the food bank. Um, do we know how many have, has there been an increase, which I would imagine, but what is the increase in the use of the food bank? And I'm realizing that there's one in seven families um, in this country who are unable to feed themselves and their children. And it's primarily single, single parents with children. So I'm wondering if we have any stats on that. And, you don't have to answer it unless you have the answer, but otherwise, if we could get that information, that would be great. Um, the other one is, I know the EATS program, you're trying to extend this so that people will have, seniors and vets will have food for the weekend. For the senior program itself, is that still Monday through when, through Friday? So that's two questions, essentially. Yeah, so, uh... On the EATS program, uh, that's still uh, Monday through Thursday. And then, I'm uh, sorry, the, our regular, our normal uh, meals that we provide through the senior center is Monday through Thursday. And then okay. the EATS program is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Is okay. that right, Susan? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then um, we'll get back to you we'll, uh, on some stats for the food bank. Um, we don't have the specific numbers. And um, Shannon, did you have anything to add to that? Or
Karen is on mute. Uh, I do know that the food bank, the number of people that they have had coming in has increased approximately 30%. Um, but they've been seeing a lot of new faces um, and they're missing a few of their frequent faces. So I don't can get you some exact percentages. I do know that food stamps were increased for the months of March and April. Um, so we are concerned about what the flow is going to look like in May. Uh, but Rochelle and I are working very close with the food bank and we, um, we are anticipating that there's going to be an increase in May and we are here for them. Uh, but I'll have those numbers for you. I'll try and get in contact with them tomorrow. Um, they are open uh, until noon but I'll try and get some numbers for you, if not by Monday. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bangs, does that conclude your questions? Yes, thank you, Mary Does. Okay, so I would like to propose a slightly different uh, path as we do this. Um, Councilmember Bangs, when you mentioned the chat, the chat creates a pop-up on my screen and it makes it very difficult to see. Um, but I saw yours come in and then right after that, I had Councilmember Mahoney and Councilmember Buxton. And then I noticed that Councilmember Harris used the raise hand feature. And I don't know if you folks can see it, but when you look at the participants, if you pop those onto the right side of your screen, there's a little raise hand button down below. Um, that could be uh, helpful for voting when we get to that point of the meeting as well. Um, but I'm, and then I had another chat pop up from Councilmember Martinelli. So I'm just going to kind of, I see, and, and Councilmember Martinelli just clicked his hand as well. So um, I'm going to take them in the order that I saw them. Uh, we just finished with Councilmember Banks, so I'm going to go to Deputy Mayor uh, Mahoney, and then I'll follow that with uh, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Harris, and Councilmember Martinelli. So Dan, and, see that coming? Okay, so uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, to the staff, on the EATS program, the fact that you included veterans uh, is near and dear to my heart, as you guys well know. I just want to say thank you. Um, I've spoken to Dale Bright at, L at Local 242, and he was ecstatic that you guys had used him as a vehicle to, um, to get out to the veterans. So can't thank you enough. Uh, one question about the EATS program. I assume the restaurants you're choosing, are you looking for restaurants that serve whole meals? Yes, yes, we're looking for what restaurants. What other criteria do you have when you select the local restaurant? Dan, would you like me to kind of. And speak as far as. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead, Susan. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we're looking at it's, um, you know, essentially to provide a lunch uh, for the days that we don't serve it at the activity center. So, you know, we are looking to have a local restaurant um, and also someone that can serve a full lunch to replace the meal that they would not be uh, getting that day. Is was the idea. Okay, next question. Um, uh, bet for Beth Ann. So on the property taxes, obviously we know that uh, King County is going to postpone those for a few months in half one. So we're probably going to get delayed revenues from that. Have you heard anything definitive on half two, like those also possibly being delayed? Um, at this time, no, I have not heard about uh, extension for the second half property taxes. Okay, and then um, I assume, obviously, I know that with uh, being in the business about sales and sales tax revenue and so forth, um, one of the things that I noticed on my last power bill was um, I'm home, so I'm using more power. It's, uh, I, I assume you guys will be looking at um, maybe some revenue increases there, or would they be offset by industry we have? Um, is that on your, is that in your house too? Um, yes, we'll be looking at all our major tax revenues because we'll be 
looking at property taxes, sales tax, and then our utility taxes. So we should see some uptick. Um, like on the sales and use tax, I mean, in our manufacturing area, there are some businesses that are actually doing more business. So we're waiting to see what increases may be in different sectors, but we also know our restaurants and our um, entertainment and salons and that type of thing, that's going to decrease. So we're kind of waiting to get that information to see what really the impacts are, but we are weighing things back and forth um, in our analysis. All right, thank you. That, that's all my questions, Mayor. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, now I go to uh, Councilmember Buxton. Oh, she's muted. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Buxton, we can't hear you. You either have to hold down your space bar while you're speaking and let go or permanently unmute yourself. And that unmute would be in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. There's a little microphone there that you'd click on. Okay, thank you. Gotcha. So, uh, so <clears throat> I am wondering if you're able to give an estimate of the total increase in investment for COVID mitigation. So we've got the EATS program that is estimated at 10K per month. And then we've got Eric uh, as business, local business, economic support. And I don't, I'm not sure if there's... And a couple of these other things that you mentioned are included. I just wondering if, if you have a, a guesstimate of how much per month are we committing to COVID mitigation for our community? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't have a specific number per month, um, but it uh, if you were to add up all of the efforts in response to uh, COVID uh, on a monthly basis, um, it's over six figures easily. When you look at all of the staff that we're talking about, Shannon's time, my time, Michael's time, EOC staff, uh, Eric's, Eric's time will be devoted specific to economic um, uh, recovery, at least through the summer and probably for the remainder of the year, because the reality is our small businesses will need support in getting access and finding uh, uh, avenues to the, the federal and state level where the revenues exist that can support those businesses. Okay, so good. It, you, we've got some business support, we've got veteran support, senior support that we're pouring into that's tan very tangible to the community. Appreciate that. So I wanted to also uh, a little bit of clarity. I think I understood about the parks, um, the the reduction in park staffing that is all related to programs that we normally have in the summer that we're not going to be able to provide because of the order, the governor's order, correct? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I'll try to answer it. And Susan, if I misstep, please correct me. Um, when the schools uh, were shut down uh, because of the outbreak. Our before and after school programs uh, went away. And so that is the staff, the part-time staff that we laid off in response to uh, the schools being closed. At this point, we haven't hired any uh, part-time staff uh, that would we normally would be in the process of hiring right now to support those summer uh, programs. And so um, the layoff of the part-time staff was specific to the before and after school type programs um, through, through the recreation department. So. Okay, uh, one more question. So I think this might be for Beth Ann. Could you uh, clarify? I think I understood that the projection was a 16% reduction uh, moving out into the year and I, when you uh, showed the list of uh, responses to that, how we're coping with that financially, does that equal, is that equal to 16% in 
if I'm understanding the first part, um, or more, are we projecting out a little bit of a cushion over that 16%? How does that total on the sheet that you showed us uh, match with that projection? Um, did I ask the that 16%, question clearly? Yeah, you did get that right. The, the 2.1 okay. is probably a little over 8% in response to the 16%. So we've, because we're the, the um, revenue estimates are down. And now when we completed um, or finished up with 2019, we actually um, underspent our budget, which means we didn't get some program things accomplished in 2019, which we would have come back to council to complete in 2020. So there's um, probably a little over a um, million dollars there that we would have come to for for things that we want to accomplish in 2020. So we will be using some of that to fill the gap. So between those two things, does that fill the 16% gap or do we still, are we still going to be possibly looking at something to come up to the 16%? So we are still looking at some things. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, uh, Councilmember Buxton. And um, the reality is we 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 make these estimates and then Beth Ann and, and her staff have uh, metrics in place to monitor those estimates. Every, every two weeks, we're monitoring our expenditures and the revenues that we receive. And we will make adjustments. We will continue to make adjustments as necessary um, based on the the trends that we're seeing in our revenues and our expenditures so that the goal would be at the end of the year that we have an ending fund balance that's at least 16.67%. Uh, that is so we have, the adequate, we have the adequate fund balance per the GFOA standards that uh, provides the cash flow that we need to pay the bills. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions for now. Hey, thank you. Um, Councilmember Harris, your hand went down, but I received a chat from you. I assume you still have questions? I do. I just wanted to make sure you can hear me. Oh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, right. Um, no, I mean, the, the protocol that I've been told is that you raise your hand and once you're acknowledged, you lower your hand. Just, you know, you don't keep your hand up forever when you're you know, in real life. So, so anyway, um, uh, so uh, I, I have many questions, but um, uh, if I could, you know, send a list of them to Beth Ann, maybe she could re reply back. Um, but um, for right now, I guess uh, my question is, how long of a cushion in cash flow does this 2.1 million represent? before you have to go into round two. Does that make sense what I just asked? I think I, I, think I understand uh, where you're going with the question. Uh, that's a great question. The, typically with the 16.67% fund balance, the intent of that is to provide two months of, of revenue of reserves so that uh, if the revenue tap was completely shut off, we could pay bills for two months. Is that right, Beth Ann? That is correct. Yeah. So um, the at this point, we, we are still uh, have a healthy fund balance. It's uh, at the level we need to, uh, for cash flow. That there has been some challenges with that. The revenue, um, reductions in revenue estimates are matched by uh, reduction in expenditures. And we will make additional reduction in, in expenditures when we know more. Okay, I'm, I guess my only question is, you know, by, that gives you, that, so you say that's two months and hopefully within two months, the fog of war will cliff, will, will lift a bit and then you can look at the real budget cuts to get us through the rest of the year and 2021. 
Would that be a fair statement? Well, those are those are the real budget adjustments that we're anticipating at this point in time. Um, we will continue to monitor that and we'll have much more detailed information for the council at the August budget retreat, um, where you'll be able to see uh, by then we'll have the, the property tax revenues in place and um, we'll have much better understanding of the true impacts um, to our revenues for the months of uh, March and April. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions? Does that conclude your questions, well, Councilmember uh, I, I would like, I mean, I don't want to, you know, make this go on forever, but I've got, you know, a, a number of specifics from her uh, bullet points, but I, I would just rather email her and just, you know, um, have her reply to them rather than, you know, taking all this time now. Um, that's fine. I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you are you, are you done at this time? And you'll send you'll send something into Dan for yeah, him I'm to send her an email with, with, with I'm, I'm send, Yeah, I'm just going to okay, send her an email with you know the specifics rather than you know this is an onerous process. So um, yeah, that's fine. I'm done. Okay. The next person who has their hand up is uh, Councilmember Martinelli. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have a couple comments and a couple questions. Um, Shannon mentioned the food bank and the work that we're doing, and, and I do want to I thank the staff for that. I also want to thank from the dais the Legacy Foundation who donated, I believe, 4000 to the food bank as well as a freezer. I also want to donate uh, one of the citizens in our city, Alina Rogers, who put together a fundraiser on social media for the food bank. And uh, within a few days, it's already raised about $1,000. My questions are in regards to the EATS program. I have three in speci three specific. Um, one, the first question is, um, why are we choosing to do just one restaurant a month? Uh, through the end of the year, that would only impact then seven restaurants. Uh, my other question is, my second, three questions. My second question is, who is the, the individual or what is the group who is deciding which restaurants are being chosen and how is that decision being made? Um, and finally, have we given any, any thought to making sure that these vouchers are purchased from local businesses that are specific to Des Moines? Because Anthony's is a great restaurant, but they have a location in Idaho. They have a location in Oregon. They have quite a few locations. So I was thinking that it would be more useful to go to businesses who only have a business here in Des Moines or only restaurants who have, who have, who have businesses here in Des Moines. Um, so, so those are the three questions. Um. Yeah, so as far as the number of restaurants that could be served, it would be uh, four restaurants a month. So every week we would choose a different uh, restaurant. Um, and we've sent out uh, information to uh, many of the restaurants and asking to, uh, for their uh, interest in participating. Um, we will continue that as long as we as we can to uh, restaurants that uh, are interested in participating and that can meet uh, some basic criteria that we would have uh, the meal uh, type uh, is being the primary uh, thing that we would be talking with them about, um, but then also uh, availabilities to um, meet uh, the seniors in the parking lot so that they wouldn't have to come into the restaurant and do all of that. Uh, so we, um, Rochelle, Rochelle and Eric are, are working on that. Um, if there are restaurants that would like to participate, they can get a hold of uh, the city staff, Rochelle or Eric, or probably be easier to go through Bonnie and we can get uh, them in touch with um, Eric and Rochelle uh, on that. Um, so the way that this works is that the city, what, we'll, what we do is we work the menu um, that meets uh, uh, the restaurant uh, co you know, costing model that, that fits. We, we uh, issue a check and buy the, the vouchers from the restaurant. So they get the, the local restaurant gets the, the revenue from the city. The city gets reimbursed for that expenditure through 
the King County um, Vets and Senior Levy money that we have. Um, and then the tickets, the vouchers that we get uh, for that particular restaurant and the menu are, are distributed through the senior center to seniors that are part of that program. And then uh, the, the local 242. And we have um, uh, some we call it like a spreadsheet where we're tracking the the, re, uh, the vouchers that get handed out. So we're tracking to make sure that those are are accounted for. Um, I can't remember if that does that answer all the questions or was there another one? Uh, I, I th thank you. I believe that answers all of it. Uh, other than, um, do you know if we uh, plan to or can we plan to make an effort to have these vouchers be purchased from restaurants that only have business here in Des Moines, not a restaurant? With all due respect to Anthony's that has multiple restaurants spread throughout multiple states. Uh, we hadn't considered that. We we're trying to support the local restaurant uh, providers here uh, in the city. I know that Anthony's has is a, a chain has a, a chain restaurants, but I think they're managed in um, locally here. So that's we're looking to support not just the restaurant but the employees within the city. At, at okay, thank you. That that concludes my questions and remarks. Hey, Dan. Thank you. Um, one moment. I, I see. Recognize Bonnie real quick. I just wanted to say that the voucher is only good for the local restaurant here in Des Moines. So while Anthony's is a chain, they can only use it here in the city. And that would go for any other chain like Red Robin or whatever else we have that might be a chain in the city. I hope that helps. Okay, I see a hand up from Council Member Banks. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bonnie. Thank you. That's what I was going to basically say uh, related to uh, Anthony's. Plus, many, many seniors have gone there, go there, and still pick up food from there. So they're, they're, they're very well liked. Um, I do want to mention, and I want to thank uh, Council Member uh, Martinelli about thanking others who have contributed uh, to the food bank. The quarter deck uh, has also done a fundraiser and raised 2,000 plus, um, and they did that in, I believe, one day. So all those who have helped and contributed towards um, you know, the food bank and the senior center and anywhere else, regardless of whether you're handing out the food or just going by and saying hi to the seniors, which is really gratifying. Um, it's, it's really a great thing to see the community coming together to do that. So I'm sure there's others that are doing it, but here's a formal thank you to everyone that's really working on this and especially our staff who are coordinating all of it. So staff, thank you very much. Hey, um, Susan, can you verify that the restaurant next week is Via Marina, is that correct? Um, yes, we are working with Via Marina for next week. Um, okay. So Rochelle's been working on that. Okay. Hi, and I see a hand from Mr. Harris, Council Member Harris. Uh, just really quickly, what are the odds of uh, distributing those flyers at, you know, Wesley and Judson and Huntington Park and that sort of thing? Um, it sounded like the flyers were just going to be at the senior center. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, the, uh, the flyers were distributing through the senior center to seniors that have been part of our program. Okay. Um, the folks at like Wesley um, and Judson and other folks places they have meals already provided during the weekends okay i'm just thinking of it in terms of ju just pr general promotion I, I understand the uh the, the point of the program but it, you know it's a nice piece i mean the flyer and um you know it might just be an encouragement to the rest of the senior community just a thought thank you yeah yeah thank you for the comment um i know that um the, this week's the first, yesterday was the first day of the program and today we handed out the, uh, the vouchers and 
very successful, a lot of energy uh, and excitement and, and enthusiasm from the seniors and the veterans about the program. So we'll have to see moving forward um, the demand for uh, this program and see um, how we can respond. Uh, we may, it may be that the, the demand for this will far exceed our uh, financial ability to respond. So we'll, we'll be monitoring that and see what, we get, see what else we can do moving forward. Okay, that takes us to the end of the administration report um, and forward to board and committee council member reports. Um, since we've had no committee uh, at meetings at this time, I will yield the first to council member Nutting. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just like to first start off by saying um, thanks to all of the staff and all their hard work, um, the EOC and keeping it together. Um, nurses, doctors that are on the front lines right now, taking care of patients and putting themselves at risk and their families at risk. Um, I'd also like to thank South King County Fire and Rescue and our police department for all they've done. Um, done a great job in keeping everybody safe and healthy. Um, I'd like to uh, make a couple comments on the consent. Um, the South Sound voting season, I'm glad they're able to kick that off with uh, Governor Inslee's allowing people to fish and, and vote. Um, sexual assault awareness, I, I believe um, that that's an incredible, incredible thing to uh, um, to promote to help keep us aware of that. Um, Van Gaskin, landscape design, it'd be nice to uh, move forward with that. Um, and um, the facility maintenance contract, uh, I will make a motion to pull that for more information. I'm sorry, um, there was only the contract in our packet. Um, so we could not compare to what was last year's and uh, um, I would, I would really like to see that go to a business here in Des Moines if that is in fact correct per Riley's comments. Um, <clears throat> and, and my last thing uh, is uh, I do know that our, uh, it's, it's been tough for everybody, right? Um, my wife has been home, luckily being able to teach the kids and, and help them through their school work Highline School District has been amazing, has, has been the front runner basically in the state with uh, delivering hundreds of hotspot um, Sprint and T-Mobile hotspots, um, 12,000 plus Chromebooks with plenty more in the works. But I, I, I work with several people that have got kids in other school districts that are not being taken care of the way that our Highline school district has taken care of this and and so I would I don't know what the format would be I'd like to make uh, I'd like to see what we could do to urge uh, Governor Inslee to make funds a available to reimburse our school district um, for the huge amount of technology that they've had to purchase over the last month and a half and to urge him to make funds available through the education program um, for other school districts uh, for reimbursement and to um, be able to purchase these technologies, which quite frankly, outside of, out, outside of Highline, there's, there's several school districts that I know of that are falling down on their job. And, and I don't know if, if we as a council, if, if the mayor and city manager can put together a letter these kids in this time are going to fall behind and it'll be the dumbing down of the nation if, if we have to allow this to move forward. So uh, I don't know, looking, looking for direction from you, Mayor, um, and uh, 
if I could, Council Member Dunning, I, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to surf through what, what, you're, what you're getting at. Um, you're concerned about the cost of the hardware that is necessary to be distributed amongst so many students um, and how that affects the district's budgets. But in addition to that hardware, there, the hardware isn't necessarily functional if there isn't um, an internet connection. And it would actually, I, I would be in favor if the council wanted to um, put together a letter uh, sign, you know, represent from, from the city manager myself to the governor suggesting that they consider uh, through educational funds, uh, some kind of voucher to help families uh, make sure that they have internet access and uh, a provided service along with um, using the dollars set aside for education um, to help pay for the hardware uh, expense that the district didn't see coming. I do know that from my experience on the school board that they're paid <laughs> used to be paid an amount per day per student as they attended. And so it's necessary that these children be able to connect and attend and participate in their programs. However, they, I mean, education is its own jurisdiction. So I think the most we can do is create a letter uh, encouraging that. And we can probably also send it to our district area representatives and, uh, you know, I uh, see about having it brought forward. I don't know how the council feels about this. Um, I do like the suggestion, Councilmember Nutting. Uh, you, you, you spoke better about it than I did, but uh, I, I, yeah, I appreciate it. Is there support for a letter of this type from the council? If there is, why don't you click your raise your hand button? I see Councilmember Buxton supporting it, Councilmember Bang supporting it, Councilmember Mahoney supporting it. I will support it. And Councilmember Martinelli has raised his hand. He is in support of it. I assume Councilmember Nutting is in support of it. At this time, I don't see a hand from, uh, let's see. So, so oh, okay, so I, I, at this time I see unanimous support, Councilmember Nutting. So I will, uh, our, our city clerk has been recording the content and will be, um, will work with um, the team to draft a letter of support and we will get that out. We will also send that, um, we, we, the council will also see a, a copy of that. Um, does that make sense? And does that suit what your request is, Councilmember Nutting? Absolutely, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council, for your support. And thank you, Mayor, um, for your support. Uh, I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, that concludes my remarks, Mayor. Okay, I will turn to Councilmember Harris for his uh, remarks. I, my remarks will be two very brief motions, um, but um, I was so moved by uh, Council Member Nutting's uh, comment, I just wanted to tag on a bit. Um, there appears to be quite broad support. Um, I heard it from our four legislators um, at, they did a 33rd town hall meeting the other day, and um, on the COVID-19 call last week, the 30th reps, um, all are talking about some sort of um, basic funding for to improve um, ISP um, availability in each of the uh, surrounding cities. And uh, I don't know, like, like Council Member Nutting, I don't know the mechanism to make it happen but I think that we should be in active dialogue with all of our uh, peer communities 
in how to make that happen. It's one thing to provide Chromebooks and all of that sort of thing, but you know, the bottom line is that this may be a permanent state of affairs and we should be thinking about a permanent solution to provide uh, low cost and reliable internet to all of our residents. Um, again, I don't know what that looks like technologically, but I think it should be something that all of our nearby communities are talking about. Um, anyway, so um, I have a motion here. Um, I'll just tell you as background, I uh, spoke with Congressman Smith's office and sent he and uh, Senator Cantwell and Senator Murray a letter um, where I expressed uh, support for a national holiday dedicated to first responders, meaning co-equal with Veterans and Memorial Day. I believe that uh, first responders now have shown that they are as valuable to the nation's security as the military and any other, uh, you know, um, defense. So, uh, uh, and I suggested that this holiday be the first Monday of April because that seemed to be the high point of uh, all of the, the different infections and um, basically all of the hard work that everyone was doing nurses, fire, um, EMT, and so on. So I move the city declare official support for a national holiday dedicated to first responders. This holiday to be celebrated the first Monday in April. The mayor would write a letter in support of this proposal to our state and federal representatives urging them to create and promote this legislation. Second. I second it, Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, is there any discussion? Oh, I'm seeing hands, I'm sorry. Uh, I will start with, uh, uh, first we'll go to Council Member Martinelli. I was raising my hand in support. I don't have any comments at the moment. Oh, okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, the other hands I see, I, if your hand's up right now, I'm assuming you want to comment. So I, I will, no, oh, they're clearing up. Mayor, can I make a brief point here? Is my uh, microphone working here? There you go, okay. Yes, Tim, please. Okay, I just want to point out, um, because this act, this item is not on the agenda, um, we can't actually um, make a motion to declare something. Uh, point, it sounds like there's a motion to write a letter in support. So we can continue with that, but if there's gonna be something that is declaring a specific date as something that would need to be done um, as an item on the agenda. Um, so we could add that for uh, our next meeting. Oh, I, 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 may, may I clarify, I'm not saying the city do anything like that. I'm just saying that we, uh, you know, write to our electeds and tell them, you know, of the idea. Um, I also want to point out one little thing. There actually is a National First Responders Day. It's October the 28th, but I think there's very little public awareness. And the whole point of making it a national holiday for me is to get the general public to reflect on the importance of first responders. So, so if I, based on what we're allowed to do under the modifications that we're currently operating under, I'm looking to our city attorney, is there something that we could do, like perhaps write a letter of support for, this topic that is out there being discussed or is I'm, I'm trying to understand what we can do yes absolutely similar to what we just did with council member nutting um, the council could through consensus uh, ask the city manager and the mayor to write a letter um, if we wanted to do something like declare a specific day um, in honor of uh, specific parties then we would need to put that on the 
just like we have on tonight, we have several proclamations on for tonight. Um, so if the council also wanted to move to put that onto a future agenda, you could do that tonight as well. That's okay, so that's I'm sorry, right. Councilmember Harris, what did you say? That's not what I'm proposing. I, I think if I understand what you're proposing, please correct me if I'm wrong. You are okay with the letter of support coming from the city going to our local and, and federal representatives supporting the idea of a national responders holiday. Correct. And that's allowable for our city attorney? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so what I would like to um, be, what I'd like to ask at this point is with your raise your hand button, if there is consensus, we'll, we'll go forward with it. Okay, I'm starting to see things light up. I got everybody. So, so I, will I will look to the city clerk and we will draft that letter. Bless you. Um, so I have one other quick motion, hopefully. Um, uh, a, a great part of my frustration so far in my tenure has been um, just, uh, I don't often understand what uh, the city manager and uh, the staff are doing. Um, we used to have for many, many years, a weekly city manager's report that ended in December of 2017. Then we had a monthly report and that ended uh, a while back. Uh, I moved to direct the city manager to provide a weekly report to the city council, which will also be made available to the public. At minimum, this shall consist, but not be limited to a calendar of the city manager's appointments, as was done last December the 9th, 2017. That's it. Okay, before we move forward with any discussion, is there a second? Second. Okay, so we have a motion made by Councilmember Harris and a second by Councilmember Martinelli. Okay, and I see, I see hands up, uh, starting with Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Um, I think before, before we decide on something like this, um, our city manager isn't here at this meeting today. I think um, we should postpone this to hear what he has to say and what the challenge is uh, for him and his staff to do so. Um, if I recall, it was quite a cumbersome thing and uh, the administrative report was taking its place, which is essentially something of the same. So my, my point is, I think we should wait and have uh, defer this discussion to our next meeting and, and for a vote. Okay, and then um, I have Councilmember Nutting. I, I agree with uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney on deferring it to the next meeting. Um, I would like a report, a little more in depth report, um, but for the city manager to be able to speak to it um, would be better to see exactly what it entails and why we have deferred uh, reporting the way we have. Okay, and before I go to the next hand that I saw come up, which would be Councilmember Buxton, the one point that I do want to remind everybody of, we do receive a quarterly PowerPoint where, if everybody recalls in a work study session, where there are slides from each of the departments that show what they've been working on, um, and they that's, that's essentially the content of uh, what was in the city manager's report. I, I personally think we should wait until Michael gets here, but we still do receive a, that report. Uh, Dan, I don't know if you have any comment to make on that. On, on the next time we would get to on the On the report. Do you, to your understanding, do we still get an administrative report? It's just in PowerPoint form? 
Yes, we would do an administrative report in PowerPoint here in a study session, just like you mentioned. Um, it's been a while since we've been able to do that in our current environment that we're in, but uh, we would plan to do that as soon as, um, as, soon as we could do that and get back to the practice. So we would, um, we could talk with Michael about uh, the next opportunity that we would be able to do that. Okay, so the next council member with their hand up was uh, council member Buxton. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, my impression was for a while it was monthly, but I would appreciate a update. It sounds like we're going to be discussing it and moving forward with a suggestion. So uh, thank you. That's and then I still have a hand up from council member Harris. Um, yeah, I am happy to defer this to the next meeting. I will just add at the risk of sounding whatever, um, you know, uh, I understand the pushback in my career. Everybody I know who is required to submit timesheets hates it. Um, but, um, you know, lawyers, I as an engineer, lots of people are required to do that. You just make that time in your schedule. And um, I would say that now, during this emergency situation, it's particularly important. In other words, if things are, you know, going along smoothly, there's no emergency, I guess I can understand monthly and so on. But right now, things change so quickly um, that to me, uh, you know, just not hearing from the city manager for a month um, just it, it is not great. So that's it. Uh, yeah, Dan, and then I'll go to Councilmember Bangs. I just wanted to add that while it is specifically uh, from the city manager, the council has been getting the updates uh, from the EOC um, that give our intended to give you an idea of, of what has been going on. And so there is some information that you're getting on a weekly basis. Um, in that regard, at least. So. Thank you. Councilmember Banks. Well, I was just going to say that I, I, I think we've been getting information. I'm not exactly 100% sure I'm clear on exactly what you're asking, uh, Mr. Harris, because as far as I'm concerned, I know that if I wanted a weekly meeting with him, I could do more in depth with the city manager or uh, Dan or any, you know. I, I won't say any staff because of course we go through Michael. Um, so I would be inclined as well to wait until the city manager is back so that we totally understand. And, and I understood perfectly why, why the, the uh, meeting or excuse me, the uh, reports were slowed down. It does take an inordinate amount of time. Um, and then the mayor also has his weekly uh, meetings as well that provides what our agenda items are. So if there's more detail, because I think what I heard you say is you want, you mentioned something about uh, uh, timesheets. Well, I'm not sure what that relevance is. Uh, the city manager manages the day-to-day. -day. So I don't necessarily want to get down into the details of that. As far as what's going on today, I think our uh, director over finance was very clear on what's going on with our next moves, which is really looking at the budget for August. Um, so I, I'm, I guess I'm still a little unclear as to what you're asking, unless you're asking for a general report uh, from him on a whatever basis it is. So I'm still not clear on what you're asking. Uh, if you look back at those older, you know, reports, I find them extremely helpful and and informative. They say I spent two hours meeting with these people and then I spent an hour doing that. And just having that is extremely helpful to me in understanding what the, uh, you know, what, what the guy does, what surmises the, uh, um, his role. So, yeah, so I don't know. It just, it's so self-evident to me. I just don't understand, um, uh, and forgive me, I just don't understand why the pushback. Um, so, yeah. Councilmember Harris, um, I do have Councilmember Martinelli's hand up, and I will that's recognize that's him that's next. But I, I do want to ask you one question. Yeah. 
We have a motion and a second on the floor. And there has been a desire expressed to address this when the city manager is present. If we vote on this tonight and it goes down, it's a done deal. If you want to withdraw the motion and bring it back up later, and I yield to the city attorney to see that I'm doing this correctly, then that would be the appropriate thing to do. Uh, so, may, may I hear from, I, I see that council member Martinelli has a comment. May I hear absolutely. from him before deciding? Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Council member Martinelli, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I just wanted to go on record and say that I very much support this motion. I think the more information that's obtainable by both the council and the public is useful. Uh, with all due respect to, to our city manager, he does work for the council, he does work for the public. I think we deserve to know what he's doing. I've spoken with quite a few city managers in neighboring cities. They almost all not only get weekly reports from the city manager, many of them get daily email reports, breaking down everything they've done for that day. Um, so I think that making the reports weekly or even monthly um, is, is a good move. And I think that it's, it's a positive step towards uh, more transparency. Okay. And then I see a hand from Councilmember Buxton. So could I offer a friendly amendment to make a motion to put this on in a future agenda? This is put this discussion on a future agenda where we know the city manager will be there, can answer questions. So instead of actually voting on the item tonight, could we amend the motion to uh, move to put this on an agenda for discussion? Will you vote for that? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have offered the friendly amendment if I wouldn't vote for it. Yes, I will. Very friendly of you. I withdraw the motion. Uh, right. Councilmember, oh. uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney. I think uh, my answer just got questioned. If we, if I wasn't going to support it, we had to vote on it today. Um, if we have a discussion at a later date, then I'm open. Okay, I, I think it. I think it makes sense that uh, we have the discussion with the city manager, and he hears the concerns, and and they get a chance to characterize things. So, uh, Councilmember Harris, you, if I understand correctly, you would on the motion, correct? I do, sir. Okay. All right. Um, that takes us forward to, does that conclude your remarks? It does indeed. Thank you for your generosity. Okay, okay. that takes us forward to Council Member Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Board and Committee reports. I did uh, meet, uh, a, I was a liaison for the farmer's market meeting and we already discussed some of the proposals the farmer's market the farmer's market board and staff is working toward uh, their their uh, certification with the Department of Health so we'll see what happens with that and I wanted to offer I've been thinking of our seniors not not just our graduating seniors but our seniors in the community don't know if I want to put this forward as a motion or not, but I thought it would be a generous uh, offering to do something as a council, let's say a 30 second video where we each say a sentence toward our seniors in our community, just saying hi to them. Uh, they're, everybody's in at home cooped up and I thought it would be nice for the council and we could distribute the video digitally or whatever, let, let some of our senior communities know it was available, that we wanted to say hi. And similarly, something uh, to make a 30 second video for our graduating seniors that says, you know, congratulations, maybe pick Federway, Highline and Mount Rainier and, you know, it's a, do a quick little drive by or balloons or we're, we're all sitting on this front steps of Federal Way High School, six feet apart, of course, waving, you know, to each 
something. I don't know if you guys would be interested in something like that. Of course, it would take a few hours of each of our time and a little bit of a monetary investment buying balloons, but uh, thought I would put that out. Uh, and before you answer that, I'll just uh, attend to the consent agenda quickly. Number five, about the Sexual Assault Awareness Month, it is late. I know it's in retrospect, but I wish every month were Sexual Assault Awareness Month, so I'm not concerned that we're pro proclaiming that late. Uh, Van Gaskin Park, I am totally in favor of that, especially since the reimbursement of about 273000 depends on moving forward. And then I have similar feelings as council member uh, nutting about the contract. So we'll be discussing that later. So what do you guys think about saying hi to our seniors, the old and the young? Um, I, I see council member nutting has his hand up before I recognize him. Uh, is your idea only open to the idea of us finding a place that we can all socially distance by six feet and say something or is yeah. it well or, is or, it or even or a compilation from home but some way of just what what you know. so what I was saying was between now and the next time we meet that gives everybody an opportunity to write or to prepare their thoughts for um, either the uh, graduating seniors letting them know that we're proud of them. And we and in a Zoom session, we're obviously recording this, we could um, take a minute possibly in the meeting if we are allowed to go outside of normal operations. And again, I will have to yield to our attorney on that. And everybody, your camera would come on and you could say your message and the, the collective council would all have something they could say that would be captured and we would be able to send that. It would be it perhaps would be a little less of a challenge in terms of people's time and getting them together and finding a location where we could all distance by six feet. So um, that's that's another way to possibly consider doing it. Um, and and if you, you know, I, I, I'm all in favor of those things, Councilmember Buxton, I, I don't, I, I just wanted to offer up that alternative because through Zoom, we could probably capture something like that at a relatively low cost and relatively quickly at, at our next meeting. So with that, something for you to think about. Uh, I'd like to send, I'd like to recognize Council Member Nutting. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I think making something for both uh, sets of seniors, as it be, um, would be a great idea. Um, I, I think that it's possible that uh, um, I think it's possible that we could all make a 30 second video for both set to seniors. Um, I do I, I do think that the Zoom thing at the next meeting would be possible too. Um, I, I, I I'm concerned about staff time if they if if it's going to take any more staff time to clip it out and send it out or um if it's it's just going to be pretty simple uh, especially with zoom um, but uh tracy great idea uh, absolutely on board uh the seniors dealing with um my children that are in middle school i i the social aspect of this whole thing is killing everybody. So um, absolutely on board, great idea. Uh, I'll support it. Councilmember Harris. Any of us have the ability and wherewithal to record a 30 second video and email it to Bonnie. Okay. And and I was thinking a little bit more along of course seven of us times two, that's that's only three and a half minutes. So I'm just thinking of something super short. So it would be more like ten seconds a piece. Well you said thirty seconds, fine. Well Five what I seconds. meant by thirty Five. second video Great. compilation, just... so that the whole thing only was thirty seconds. Fine. Um, How many of us know how to record a video of any length and send it to Bonnie? I, I think many of us can do that, Councilmember Harris. I think the issue is 
once you get a series of independent videos, you've got to bring them together and so forth. I would like to suggest the that uh, the the council, our, our our city clerk, has heard what we're talking about, and she can talk with um, our our IT department, and we can look at what would be the um, ease, the simplest from the staff perspective. Um, to put something like this together that could be easily distributed. One of the advantages of using Zoom is all our faces are there. And so we are being, we are speaking as a council where everybody has an independent moment. And I think that's a pretty powerful statement. But I would, if with the council's indulgence and uh, council member um, Buxton, I think I'm not seeing anybody who's not in favor of the idea. Um, I mean, would you be willing to let uh, staff look into your suggestion and communicate out to us what they might they feel they might be able to do? Evans, yes. It's just, it's a, put it out on the table for for reflection and and discussion. So absolutely, whatever works. Okay, so. Uh, with the council's indulgence, I will ask the city clerk to follow up. And uh, can you get back to us so we have time to prepare for this? Is a week enough time? Oh, well, yes, I think that can work. Okay. Does that conclude your remarks, Council Member Buxton? Yes, that does, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. The uh, next person is Councilmember Martinelli. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my comments will be short today. I just wanna echo some of my colleagues and, and thank first responders and medical professionals, those who are on the front lines of this pandemic, keeping us all safe. Uh, we obviously owe them a debt of gratitude that we probably never will be able to repay. So I just wanna send out a thank you to them and that's all the remarks I have for today. Thank you. Councilmember Banks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did attend the April 13th uh, a meeting of the Arts Commission and, and I'll defer to Susan Cesar exactly what, what she discussed was what we discussed. It's a tough time for, um, for all groups, but that one in particular because of all of the great ideas they had for the summer concerts and things going on in the fall. So that's unfortunate, but there's some ideas that might crop up for virtual stuff. I also attended a Zoom meeting for the uh, SKIP Executive Board. And um, I did relay the information to uh, City Manager Matthias that, um, you know, all the, all the cities are going through what we're going through. Some, of course, worse. And so the financial aspect, we're pretty solid for 2020, but we got to look at later 2020, 2021 in terms of financing um, for that. Um, for that group, even though it's extremely important, you know, in terms of housing and homelessness. So that's something that he will take up, I believe, with staff and find out uh, what direction we need to go in. And um, as far as me being the liaison on that committee, I've asked him to uh, actually have more staff involved. So because most of the uh, those that are represented on that committee are staff uh, in lieu of those who are uh, the three mayors or the two mayors that are extremely involved in it. So that's the mayor uh, of Auburn and the mayor of, um, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Don't quote me. <laughs> but anyway, I believe it's more important for, for staff to be involved, especially in the economic development side, because it was remanded to economic development. Um, so there's lots going on. Uh, homelessness won't go away. It's going to be extremely, extremely difficult with this COVID as well. Uh, it's going to be worse. So that's sort of where I am in terms of my reports. And then I also have several comments for um, the uh, consent agenda item number seven that we'll get to. That concludes my report. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I'll make my comments on um, the uh, consent agenda first. Um, first of all, item three, um, the 24th, where I'd love to see a lot of the power lines be buried, uh, understanding with 
initiatives like 976, the impacts of COVID-19, et cetera, it's gonna set our city back financially. So saving uh, three quarters to a million dollars to get something done to make it safer for our kids to get to school is a no brainer. Can't say enough about the Van Gaskin piece. Um, we've all been waiting. I've loved that you guys have really made an effort as a staff for the partnership with the tribes and so forth. Everybody's looking forward to this being a, a jewel of a park and I know it'll get there. So I'm excited to have it in the direction. I'm gonna hold off on item seven cause I see this heading there. Um, at, as it was mentioned, the parade and the fireworks are canceled. We are working on a virtual parade. I will be reaching out to you, out to you and we won't have to get into discussion about methods of video right now, but each of you will be expected um, to submit some kind of video. We, we have footage from the 70s and VHS we're gonna convert, stuff from last year. We're gonna incorporate businesses and neighborhoods. It's very exciting. The parade committee is uh, ecstatic to take this new route to, to do something we can to build community. We got some great ideas. We've been partnering with the city as far as using Channel 21 and other medias to televise it. Um, so we're gonna like stay at home and, and, and have a parade with the community. So we're excited to give it a try. It will be a uh, new territory for us all. Um, I already talked about the EATS thing. I do wanna thank uh, first responders, our medical people as well. I think they've done a great job. But I also wanna give a special thanks to the staff, particularly our key leadership. The fact is, is that you are all, we're already working a lot of hours. And I know that under this, you've actually been working more and a lot of your staff too. And I just want to wholeheartedly thank you. A lot of people don't realize that your workload went up um, during this, this time and season, and it's appreciated a lot of media response and other things. Um, we'll be moving according to the governor to the phase two in the next few weeks, I assume. I just want to caution our residents who are listening that still maintain the good habits of wearing masks and social distancing it's been the acts of the few that have hurt the benefit and the freedoms of the many. If we can do that, you hear the story of the guy that pushes somebody in the water or shoots them, and, and that's just ridiculous. It's like, come on, everybody be cool to each other. And so I asked for that. Um, also, I know there's been a lot of comments about helping our community. Um, and we, we, we want to help. I, I know that every council member here wants, and staff wants to help the community. We gotta be careful um, how we do it and we can't politicize it. It needs to be careful and calculated. As you guys saw in the financial thing, when we're gonna receive our monies and the cash flow and all those kinds of things are pertinent. Also, there's more to consider than just the immediate um, throw money at a problem or a situation that may not be a problem or is a problem. There has to be research and analysis. The other thing is there's some side effects that I want the public to be aware of. We're trying to develop this town. One of the things you guys have cried out for is this downtown development. We need to be fiscally responsible and financially sound. We need to make sure that we're using your money effectively and we have to do it under the code of the law. So we ask for your patience. Suggestions are great and everybody has some good ones that want to help, but there's more to it than just what, what's on the surface. And I ask for your understanding from that and, uh, when we get into those situations, I'm sure we'll provide uh, explanations of what we can and can't do when the opportunity avails itself. So thank you. That's that's my comments, Mayor. Deputy Mayor Mahoney, I believe you have a question from Council Member Nutting. I just have to comment on um, the virtual parade. Um, great engineer. Uh, uh, I, I lost the word ingenuity, um, ingenuity on that. Um, I'd be glad to participate with that. Good, good job there. Um, I know the family and I will get behind that. And uh, um, I, I know these are uncharted territories and I'm just outside of the box thinking is gonna get us through this. Thank you. The yeah, the exciting thing is, is not only will we do those things, but we're gonna, and more information will come out later, but even families or neighborhoods can uh, submit a video to represent them. So uh, trying to build community in a time where you have this separation, I agree with you, but I can't take the credit. 
it is this committee and Destination Des Moines and a partnership. And then of course, like Bonnie and other people, uh, Scott Schaefer from Waterland Blog that are all willing to help us get there. So it's gonna be a real team effort of the community as well. But I think it'll be a great hour and a half, and that's normally what the parade is, of very entertaining TV. So thank you um, for your uh, compliments, but I do have to give the credit to everybody else. All right, thank you. Um, since we last met, I've had a number of teleconferences, um, a few with uh, the 30th District Democrats, WIRA 9, which uh, watershed meetings. Um, and some of those are trainings as well, because I'm new to that committee. Uh, there was a mayor's call with the governor. We actually spoke to the governor's aide. Um, normally those calls are put together by Sound Cities Association. And the truth of the matter is um, because there are so many mayors on the call, there really aren't, isn't an opportunity for, for questions. It's kind of a, um, there are some questions that do come from uh, Sound Cities Association, but um, a lot of what's shared there are kind of what the governor's office is thinking about their next step. And um, usually these meetings have occurred before noon and there has been a, uh, a, a press conference shortly after noon. Um, so the other thing, uh, and then there was a South Sound Mayor's teleconference where um, the, the mayors get together and kind of talk about what their cities are doing and share some ideas. Um, and I would say that we are tracking really well with uh, our peers in terms of what others are doing. And then I had an opportunity to, to um, I, I was contacted by a Seattle Times reporter. Um, and the, the essential question that was asked of me was, if somebody wanted to help, how, how, would, how would you, what would you think about what they should do? Where would they write the check? And it was really a thought provoking question. And, and so when I had the time to talk with them, I actually added it in um, my comments that will come out into the city currents because we're all in a different situation. This is obviously new territory for all of us. And some of us, for some people, they have more money than they have time. For some people, they have more time than they have money or somewhere, people are somewhere in between. And so in the conversation, you know, if, if someone is best in a position to want to contribute financially, there's food banks, there's senior services, there's women and children's shelters, um, and there's you, you can buy personal protective equipment. And even if you buy it on Amazon today and it doesn't show up for 30 days or whether you buy it on Amazon or not, I am not uh, promoting Amazon um, or saying anything against them. I'm just saying, you know, wherever you choose to get it, even if it doesn't show up for a while, the need will still be there. And if you can acquire more than what your personal need is, you have the opportunity to share it. I think this community has done a great job at um, trying to support our local businesses through uh, takeout opportunities and so forth. But, you know, there's, there's folks you don't want to forget and, and they aren't really out there. And those would be people who are, who provide us services like people who cut your hair or something like that. It's worth it to reach out to them and offer to buy a gift certificate, but be mindful that if you buy the gift certificate, maybe, the gift certificate is for two sessions and you can only use 50% of it as a time at a time, because even though they need the income right now, when they start working, if everybody's using gift certificates, they're going to need the cash flow. So it's something to think about there, but on the volunteer side, obviously you can still um, help with food banks um, or uh, places that help to sort clothing and, and, and things like that. Um, you deliver meals. And, and what I, you know, strongly urge people to do is to think about your neighbors or those who may have a hard time. Um, we, we have, I've come across some senior citizens that aren't really computer savvy and 
The fact is they used to be able to pick up the phone and call a restaurant and they would get delivery. Some restaurants will still work through things for them, some won't. And so helping them order for, you know, order for them, go get their groceries. Many of, there are many folks that have, uh, are of high risk for a variety of reasons and they're uncomfortable going to the grocery store or they're, uh, and, or they're just in need. And you know, we wanna try and take care of those folks. And even when you're taking care of your, fam your own family, um, buy some extra supplies. You never know when you might see your neighbor um, and, and they, they're saying, boy, we ran out of this and I, I just can't get out. I saw a situation today on the national news where someone was um, thinking about um, single mothers that have very, very small children. Um, again, it's hard for them to get out and they're also going to be very uncomfortable with the possibility that they may expose their infant. So it's really just, and also I guess in closing, this is not an unimportant group either. Just remember the people that live alone. They, um, they may be um, staying home and staying safe, but they may not have anybody to talk to. And sometimes that's all someone needs. So I just encourage people to consider those thoughts. Those were, that was the impetus of, and, and the, the bulk of my conversation with the Seattle Times. And I know all of my colleagues on the council are mindful of these things. I know all the staff is mindful of, of these items, but sometimes it's just, you have to say it to get people to think about it. And I'm sure I haven't covered all the bases. So with that, that concludes my report. Will the, clerk, will the clerk please read the consent calendar? Item one, approval of vouchers. Item two, approval of minutes. Item three, 24th Avenue South Improvements Project, Kent Des Moines Road, SR 516 South 223rd Street. 2020-2021 on-call General Civic Engineering Services. Consultant Design Task Assignment 2020-01. Item four, South Sound Boating Season Opening Day. Item five, Sexual Assault Awareness Month Proclamation. Item six, Van Gaskin Park Landscape Design Task Order. And item seven, Contract with Facility Maintenance Contractors for Janitorial Services in City Buildings. And that concludes the consent calendar, Mayor. I apologize for the feedbacks, folks. That is something that we are going to have to figure out. Um, obviously, there's a feedback loop, even though we're six, eight feet apart. Yeah. So we we will um, we will work on that. Um, I see uh, Council Member Nutting has his hand up, and I think I know why. Um, as a matter of procedure, um, we generally move forward to approve the consent account consent calendar before we pull items from it. So yes. So at this time, I will ask, is there a motion to approve the, the consent calendar? Uh, Council member Nutting, I saw your hand first and then Council member Harris. So moved, Mayor. Okay, and do I have a second? Uh, okay. for, and the second came from, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Council Member Banks. So I have a motion. No, Council Member Buxton. Oh, was it Council Member? Yeah. Okay, motion was by Council Member Nutting. And a, um, the second was by Councilmember Buxton. Thank you. So at this time, does any council member wish to remove any items? And I see council member Nutting's hand. I would like to remove item number seven for further discussion. Okay. Um, I have, Councilmember Harris has a hand up. 
I would like to remove uh, item number three. Item number three, okay. Is there anyone else who wishes to remove anything? Okay, seeing no hands at this time, we will be voting on items one, two, four, five, and six in, in the block. So all those in favor, well, is, is there any discussion of those items at this time? I see a hand with council member Buxton. No, I'm sorry. Oh, people were clicked on the draw because I was counting for the vote. Okay, seeing no hands on the table, all those in favor of the consent agenda as with items three and seven removed, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, Council Member Harris, I, are, are, you, uh, are you voting against? I vote against. Okay, so the consent agenda as modified passes six to one. Okay, if you could uh, move down the hands, please. And then I will go to um, the first item that was pulled, which is item uh, number seven. And Council Member Nutting, you have the floor. I would like to understand further if um, the points that Riley Bancroft brought up are true, uh, that we are going to spend an extra $108,000 to employ a company outside of the city and, and not go with the company that is currently doing the uh, janitorial services for our offices um, that is a small business inside the city uh, I'd like to understand a little bit more and and not providing that with the packet have they have they decided not to bid this project or is that is there another shakeup going on um, so um, being fiscally responsible and uh, not allowing a Des Moines business to have this project. Uh, I just, I, I'd like to understand it better, please. And, and I'm sorry for the late um, questions about that. If we got to boot it to another council meeting, um, I'm for that as well. So are you making the motion to take item seven and move it to another council meeting? Um, we need to be Oh, okay. Dan, is your mic on? All right. Okay, please, please restate what you just did. Said. Uh, we would like to make a brief presentation about this agenda item and move it forward if possible tonight, given the, the situation we find ourselves in. So, Brandon Carver is available, and I would call on him to uh, provide some background and. Uh, potentially respond to um, some of the cost uh, questions. I can't I understand you, Dan. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's anybody else, but you're very garbled. I'm not getting the message. Okay, I'm going to try something here. Uh, they're having a hard time hearing you, Dan. Is your micro is the microphone next to you on or off? Off. Okay, I'm going to mute mine over here. And I'm going to ask that you restate what you just did, what you just said. Can you guys hear me now? There? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we are prepared to uh, make a uh, presentation from the staff on contract. Brandon Carver is on the line. Um, so I would like him to give some background as to our janitorial contract and answer some of the questions relative to the cost questions that were proposed under citizen comment. I'm, I'm absolutely okay. open to that. Okay. At, okay. at this time, 
before we move forward with that presentation, were the questions from Councilmember Bangs and Councilmember Harris, do you wanna get your question out first or do you want the staff to give their presentation first? Uh, presentation, presentation first. Presentation. That's fine. Okay, so it looks like people would like to hear what you what you're you have to say. So at this point, to try and cut down on some of the feedback, I'm going to mute my microphones. And if you can't hear Dan, please raise your hand when he starts speaking, and we'll make adjustments. Can this is Brandon? Actually, can you guys all hear me? Just nod your head, or okay. Uh, so I appreciate the questions, Councilmember Nutting, and um, yeah, just, just maybe a little more explicit background, and, and uh, hopefully Shannon is also listening in as well. Uh, she may be be able to provide some um, some input as well. But we we have had ABS as a uh, our contracted janitorial uh, vendor for for quite some time. Continued to extend the contract, um, and. Uh, have in historically gone just a low bid proposal. Um, and I think in, in the recent years, and this could extend back uh, a few more, we've had uh, just several quality control issues. And so we felt it appropriate. Um, the, con the current contract expired at the end of 18. Uh, we felt it appropriate uh, to go out for a new contract under an RFP type proposal situation so that not just price was involved, but also um, quality and level of service. Uh, and we we did get three uh, vendors, as you see in the in the packet. ABS did put in for that. Um, to clarify the um, public comment earlier, the current contract we have with ABS is about 198,000 annually. We don't. The, the $145,000 figure is actually what we typically spend because we always have a contract value that's higher than uh, what we anticipate due to the fluctuation of rentals. And so the contract value proposed tonight with FMC likely wouldn't be hit, especially uh, this year um, due to obviously the, the rental impacts. And, but that's sort of the high mark. Um, and, and as the this so the citizen mentioned a hundred forty five thousand dollar contract it's actually one hundred ninety eight thousand but we there would be an increase I'm not going to uh, say that it's not there's certainly an increase in the annual uh, expenditure uh, at least from a contracting perspective of about fifty five thousand uh, um, the review team included several staff members from different departments including police, uh, marina, uh, our beach park, uh, event center, the rentals, um, city hall, et cetera. And it was a unanimous decision to uh, move ahead with uh, what we felt was like a contract or a vendor that would provide the level of service we were looking for. We had started this process sort of pre-COVID-19. Um, and, and to be honest, I think, um, the the value we're placing on uh, public building cleanliness and for for public sa public safety and and staff safety is is um, worth the value. Uh, certainly, ABS. I will tell you they had a lower uh, price proposal, but again, uh, the the summary of the decision came down to um, level of service uh, as well as um, customer service uh, as mentioned in the packet the, the FMC you're right is not a local company per se uh, in Des Moines uh, but they have been awarded twice the city of Kent Chamber of Commerce uh, business of the year um, they come you know they they have a, a high pedigree uh, come well recommended um, and, it, and it's more a service decision and valuing um, the building cleanliness going forward. I would also open the floor to Shannon if she wanted to add into that as she was front frontline working with ABS for several years as our uh, rental 
uh, coordinator um, in, her, in her previous life. But, and then I'd be happy to try to answer any questions, but that's where we have the staff recommendation. Hopefully that helps at least provide some framework. Okay, um, the hands that I saw before, oh boy. Well, first of all, Dan, did you have anything else to add to that? Can you, can everybody hear me okay? okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I want to make uh, one point, and if you have your agenda packet in front of you, on the on the front page, so it's page seventy one. Yeah. Um, you will notice every single department director and manager signed this agenda item. That has never happened in the fifteen years that I have been here, and it speaks to not only the, the uh, financial commitment of the directors to um, pick up the additional cost for this service, but more than that, it speaks to the need for a new vendor. Uh, Brandon was being very polite in his remarks about quality uh, control issues that we've had, and, um, and it's time for a change. That concludes my comments. Okay, I've got a number of hands, and so I'm going to go with uh, what, I, what I've written down. I think council member, I had Harris, Banks, Buxton, and then Mahoney, and then. Uh, am I up? I could, I could, I can't hear you well, Mayor. Is it my turn? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Yes, let okay. me let me repeat. I have H Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Bangs, Buxton, Mahoney, and Nutting, and Councilmember Harris, you have the floor. Uh, I won't belabor the obvious. Um, Dan, thank you for being direct. I assume you gave ABS every opportunity to remedy whatever issues. It sounds like the, you know you had many conversations with them. Um, the only question I have is that um, Brandon said something about their, the actual cost that you spend every year is not necessarily the full amount of the contract. So is it really $55,000 more than what you're paying ABS now? Or is that just, you know, the cap? Does that make sense what I'm asking? It, that makes sense. The question makes sense and that we will spend more um, because the base, if you look uh, at attachment to the base of services is about 180,000. And so um, with that and you add consumables, I do think we're going to spend uh, 55 to 60,000 more. But as you've heard, uh, we're um, making a recommendation that that's worth the expenditure. Thank you, sir. Okay, the next person would be Council Member Bangs. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so can someone really walk us through, considering where we are with COVID, the extra work that it, it will entail to keep our buildings and our staff safe, which is primarily a lot of what we're talking about here. Because you want a company that knows what they're doing. You want a company that responds quickly. You want a company that's got the tools and equipment and also the ability to, to provide their own staff with the proper PPE. So can Brandon, can you or, and I also wanna hear from Shannon because Dan, I think you asked her to speak or Brandon, you did as well. Uh, well, the, the, let me try to answer the question. Uh, the janitorial contract is, is structured very similar to the current one we have as far as uh, each facility has different uh, different schedule of cleaning. Certainly the, the COVID um, uh, um, time has, has uh, highlighted the need for cleanings and, and they're, they're, they will be obviously paying special attention to the high touch areas. Uh, we have, Shannon's been working with uh, a, a separate vendor for doing what we call sort of deep 
uh, disinfect disinfection type cleaning. Um, hopefully that's a reimbursable expense with, with another vendor, but uh, that is, so uh, there is an awareness of, of uh, the cleaning going forward with, with uh, the, the high touch areas, if you will. And I think all the more reason why we want a, a vendor that has a track record of um, high quality service in that. Um, and, and obviously we'll continue to work with them as, as this evolves as, you know, in, in what areas need to change. I mean, we've, we kind of went through this RFP selection process as COVID-19 unfolded. So we're in, in a way a bit learning as we go uh, as to what the best, you know, best management practice will be uh, going forward. Shannon, anything to add to that? No, I just agree with you. I can't understand, I'm Shannon. On the customer service. And Shannon, we're having a hard time hearing you. I think your signal is pretty weak. Said, I think we're all on this. We, yeah, I think so too. I'll put it in the chat box. Actually, wait, wait. You just clear. You just cleared up. Do you mind restating? Oh, she left. She left. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Okay, all I really heard her say was, yeah, I agree too. So I don't know. Um, okay, Councilmember Banks, you have the floor. That, that's fine. Thank you, Brandon. I appreciate that. And I know the COVID did unfold as you were going through this uh, process, but I, I think I have to agree. I don't think I've seen this many signatures uh, on, on a consent agenda. Uh, item, actually any item. So thank you for that uh, that note. Does that conclude your questions, Councilmember Banks? Sorry, Mary, yes. Uh, then I saw, okay, hands are coming up and down. The next one was Councilmember Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. So I, I'm wondering just if, if somebody could clarify how much of this is um, cleanliness versus actual safe if they're actual safety issues uh things being left in stairwells or something that's physically dangerous i suppose there's a cloudy uh definition of that now with covid but just wanted to hear a possible response there um Which with regard to our current a liability issue um, that's, that's a fair question. I think the, I don't, I don't know if I can speak, um, specifically to the liability aspect other than to say that several of our challenges were, um, quality of cleanliness, um, mm -hmm. and, and really honestly, um, paying for the time that, and the service that we were not getting or was, um, the effort was not there, um, I don't know if that would translate to liability going forward, but certainly, um, you know, one could extrapolate that, but, um, uh, but that's a whole, you know, a uh, whole, I don't want to do the comment there. Just, just challenges with getting what we paid for, um, uh, as far as value. And so then secondarily, let's say we vote, what, what's the consequence if this does not pass? tonight what's the consequence for that a good question we are uh under contract with abs technically uh, we're in the middle of an, a three-year extension although there's the uh we would uh, if it passes tonight we would be exercising our 30-day notice both the vendor and the city have that option in the contract but if it doesn't pass tonight um we're still within a we're, we still have them under contract of service through the end of uh, 
22, I think, I, whatever, three years from uh, the end of 18. 21 minutes, yeah. So if you wanted to bring this up at a different time, you could you could put this on the agenda after COVID and give them the 30 days, feasibly. Contractually, yes, we could do that. Okay. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Before I go to the next uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, uh, I'd like to ask Dan Brewer, when I suggested that this may be move, need to be moved, you were reticent to do so. And could you please help the council understand that? So the, the main issue is as we, as we strive to begin to uh, open up City Hall, uh, not only for our staff, but for the public, um, the cleanliness of the city facilities is paramount, especially in this time. And um, we will not get the quality of service we need with our current contract. Okay, I'm going to go to Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Mayor. So it sounds like uh, you took into consideration, obviously, the new normal of clean, which is going to be very important. Um, you can just say yes or no to these questions pretty much. So I'm asking you, Dan. Yes. Okay. And it looks like you worked with ABS, our local business, and worked with them on multiple occasions and gave them every effort to provide the service that was expected. But still through this review process and through their past history, you didn't see that happening. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We have we have worked with them expressing our concerns um, for several years in an effort to try to get better performance out of the contract and that did not uh, prove fruitful. Okay. And the fact that every single department signed off on this in the recommendation as this to be the best new supplier, regardless of the fact, I, obviously we do contracts with, we, we want to do local when we can, but we have to do with with the best best people that can provide the best service regardless of the city correct that's correct all right thank you next council member is council member nutting and then i see council member martinelli just raised his hand so i'll go from council member nutting to council member martinelli oh and thank you okay and then it looks like after council member martinelli we will have council member Bangs for her second and final time. Thank you. Um, I, I initially removed this item for this kind of discussion. Um, I absolutely want um, businesses in our community to get uh, the contracts that we are able to give them. Um, I have seen that you've vetted out this contractor and to me, um, without sounding very curt, is that this contractor has become very complacent in the fact that they've won these bids over and over and over again, and um, absolutely support going out to another contractor that all others have supported. Um, I hate to see it go away from a Des Moines small business, but uh, in light of the COVID 19 outbreak. Uh, we, we can't put our city employees and other customers at risk. Um, so I absolutely support going to um, our new supplier. Councilmember Martinelli, it looks like your hand came down. Did your question get answered? Uh, no, I just put it down because you addressed me. Oh, okay. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. My question is just to Dan. Uh, you had mentioned that we have had issues with this current contractor for several years um, and that we've been trying to work with them for several years to fix those issues. If that's the case, why are we just now getting a new contract? If this is something that's a multi-year issue, um, what, why is it being addressed now and hasn't been addressed um, prior to another, prior to their last contract being approved, if that's, if that's been an ongoing issue? 
Yeah, that's a very great question and a fair question. And I, I think that it goes to uh, the point that Council Member Nutting was making about trying to do as much as we could to work with the local vendor here within the community and give, give every chance we could to uh, get the better performance uh, on the contract that we needed. And so um, um, that, that's, uh, we, were, you know, we did our best to work with them. And so, yeah, it took some time to get to this point. Uh, we had put the, RF, the uh, request for proposals out uh, earlier in the year. And just with the COVID um, um, interruption, uh, we had hoped to bring this to council earlier earlier in the year, um, but um, so anyway, those are some of the reasons to explain why the time frame. Thank you. Before I go to Councilmember Bangs, it looks like Shannon Kirchberg was able to get back on. Shannon, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, Mayor. I'm good. I just wanted to make sure that I had a chance to back up Brandon um, and let you know that it, it really is a customer service issue and uh, we are definitely in need of a new vendor. So thank you. Thank you. And I go to council member Banks. So I just wanted to thank Brandon, Shannon, and, and Dan. Um, I think I was on the council both times that this contract came up and, and uh, I, I would say that uh, I think it was council member nutting about complacency. Sometimes that does happen. Doesn't mean that in the future they can't bid again. It simply means they have to do a better job of what they do. And I for one would strongly urge all of us to vote for this because I don't wanna second guess staff at all as it relates to safety. Not only that, you, you gotta, pay for what you get. And I don't care if you're local, I don't care if you're national. You have to make sure you get what you pay for. So I appreciate all of your input related to our questions. Thank you. Oh, uh, looks like I had a last minute hand from Council Member Buxton. No, I appreciate the discussion about this. And I think for me, it was economic issue, safety issue, I think uh, if it weren't for COVID, you know, it would have been it would have been hands down like go ahead and go with a new one. But now the economy, the economic issues, but um, uh, put pressure on me. But then I think the only reason we're here is a health and safety issue. Uh, so I think if this this health issue has uh, stopped the whole world, I think. That's what I'm going to let uh, weigh my decision here is a health and safety issue. So I, I'm uh, before this, I'll be fine with this. So thank you. So council, we're now at the point of voting. The motion that is in the um, packet is a move to award goods and services contract with facility maintenance contractors known as FMC for janitorial services in city buildings from June 2020 to December 2023 for an estimated annual amount not to exceed 253,076 and additionally to authorize the city manager to sign the contract substantially in the form as submitted. Let me jump back over. All those in favor, I'm sorry. I, oh. Do we have I, a second? I, I said, yeah, I move to make that motion. Second. Okay, so the motion was made by uh, Council Member Nutting. The second came from Council Member Banks. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. I, and can you click your button? There we go. Okay, um, I have the eyes at myself. 
uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Martinelli, Councilmember Nutting. Councilmember Banks, are you opposed or in favor? This thing uh, isn't working. I'm in, I'm in favor. <laughs> okay, motion passes 7-0. Okay, that takes us, that completes item seven. Uh, Tim has, yes, uh, we have a hand up from our city attorney. Mayor, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but um, our consent calendar is generally known as a unanimous consent calendar, which requires a unanimous vote. Uh, because the vote was six to one, essentially it means that all those items are now removed to our new business calendar. So we still have to pass all other items that were on the consent. Okay, so you're saying that we've only passed item seven? Yes. yes. So you could just walk through those one by one fairly quickly, uh, but if a council member wants to vote no on a specific consent calendar item, they should pull that item and then vote yes on the entire consent calendar. Having a no vote on the consent calendar um, applies to all items and removes them from the unanimous consent calendar. Okay. Um, given that, Well, can I get a hard copy because I don't have all the, all the motions in front of me? Sure. Okay. Item number one. Approval of vouchers. The motion is to approve for payment vouchers and payroll transfers through April 30th, 2020 in the attached list and further described as follows as um, we have total AP checks, electronic wire transfers, payroll checks, payroll direct deposits for total checks and wires for AP and payroll of $1,543,771.64. So moved. Okay, motion made by Council Member Nutting. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Bangs. Any discussion on this? Hearing none, um, I do see some hands up there. Have people just voted quickly? Okay, all those in favor, the, I'm not hearing any discussion. So all those in favor, please raise your hand on the, on the board. Okay, motion passes 7-0. I'm taking us down to item number two. Approval of minutes. Motion so moved. <laughs> motion was to approve uh, February 27th, 2020 special meeting, the February 27th, uh, March 26th, and the April 9th regular meeting. I have a motion by Council Member Nutting. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Any discussion? I have a number of hands up on the board. Is there discussion? If, if you don't, um, please lower all the hands. It looks like our city attorney has a hand up. Is there a comment? Nope, okay. So all hands are down. Only raise your hand if you have, if you wish to discuss. Seeing no hands come up, all in favor of I, the approval of minutes, please raise your hand. Okay, the only hand I do not have up is that of Councilmember Harris. So Councilmember Harris, I assume you're voting nay. Correct. Okay, item number two, the approval of minutes passes 6-1. Okay, we're moving to item number three, which was pulled and we handled. No, 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 no I'm sorry, that has, we have not. So. Thank you. I appreciate the help. We are on item number three that was pulled by Councilmember Harris. Councilmember Harris, I give you the floor. 
my colleagues, I will not tax your patience. Uh, I know it's been a long slog. Uh, I will just tell you I wanted this pulled because I submitted several technical questions on this to the city manager and received no reply. And when I don't get a reply, it doesn't make me happy. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just putting it on the record now. If I ask questions regarding something like this, I expect to receive a responsive reply. That's all I have. Carry on with the vote, please. I move okay. to pass the motion. We have the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, and Councilmember Nutting, you're referring to motion number one, correct? Absolutely. Second was from Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Any discussion? All those in favor, please put your hand up. Okay, I have six up. Councilmember Martinelli, I do not see your hand, so I'm assuming you are voting nay. That is correct. Okay. Motion number one passes 6 1 with Councilmember uh, Martinelli voting nay. Okay. Now we are at motion two. Motion number two, <laughs> Councilmember Nutting. We have a motion by Councilmember Nutting. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Mahoney. Any discussion? Yes, Mayor. Okay. Uh, I just I have, wanted to uh, make it clear. I asked several questions regarding the uh, not only the cost, but also what is involved in uh, laying these underground wires and why it is so much more expensive. I did not receive an answer. And I believe that that is something that the public asks about all the time. Why? is this sort of thing so much more expensive? And if I can't get an answer for tonight's vote, I would beg the uh, Brandon, whoever, to make such information available to the public because they ask a lot. That's it. Here. Go ahead. I I think I know that Michael sent you a response on the, the cost uh, issue relative to grounding. The the specifics of why it's um, on this particular project with technical um, or field type uh, challenge. Sir, sir, excuse me. I am not asking for a reply at this point. I have already said this is fine. I'm not trying to be quite, frank, uh, quite frankly. You said that you didn't get a reply, and I was copied on the reply. I'm yeah, just saying. I just the, it's passed. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of motion number two. Um, to direct staff to make necessary arrangements to have all the existing overhead utilities relocated aerially as needed for construction on the 24th Avenue South Improvement Project. All those in favor, please put raise your hand. Okay, so I've been asked to read this out loud. Um, hands voting in the affirmative are Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, and myself. That's five. And am I to assume Councilmember Harris and Councilmember Martinelli, you are voting nay? I vote nay. Correct. Councilmember Harris votes nay, and Councilmember uh, Martinelli votes nay. Okay, motion passes five to two. Our fourth item is the South Sound voting season open. open. Move to approve. <laughs> okay, motion to approve the vote, the uh, proclamation. Is there a second? Second. Uh, motion made by Councilmember Nutting, second by Councilmember Bangs. Any discussion? Councilmember Nutting, you have a hand up. Do you wish to discuss? 
No, sir. Just voting in the affirmative. <laughs> okay. Um, all those in favor, please put your hand up now. Motion passes 7-0. Okay, please lower your hand. Item number five is sexual assault. Motion to approve. Okay, it's the proclamation for sexual assault awareness month. I have a motion to approve by council member Nutting. Second by. Second. Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> Motion passes unanimously at 7 0. Motion to approve item number six. I just got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, motion number six is the Van Gaskin Car uh, Park landscape design. I have a motion to approve by Council Member Nutting. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Seconded by Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes 7-0. And we already dealt with item number seven. So at this time, I will read the proclamation summaries into the record. The Des Moines City Council hereby proclaims May 9th, 2020 as this year's South Sound opening day of boating season and asks that as the threat of the pandemic passes, the community joins in supporting the Des Moines Yacht Club advocacy for safe enjoyment of boating for all and the promotion of the Des Moines waterfront amenities serving the South Sound boating community. And now therefore the Des Moines City Council hereby proclaims the month of April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city of Des Moines and encourages all citizens to join in this special observance and join advocates and communities across the country in taking action to prevent sexual violence. I'd like to note that Sound Cities Association have been working with local municipalities to have their councils approve the Sexual Assault Awareness Pro Month Proclamation. And while the month to observe has passed, we are assured by Deanna Dawson at Sound Cities that it is still okay to approve this proclamation after the fact and that other cities are also doing the same thing as we are all on different schedules right now due to the pandemic. Council, that takes us to the end of the meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled for May 28th. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Hang on, hang on one moment, please. Scott? Scott, oh, Scott, Scott Wilkins, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> I thank you, Mayor and City Council. I appreciate this. This is normally the time I embarrass Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> so continue. Monday is her birthday, so I just want to say happy birthday. I'm just kidding. <laughs> happy birthday, happy Bonnie. Birthday. Happy birthday, Bonnie. Thank happy birthday, Bonnie. Thank you. Happy birthday, Bonnie. Thank you. I have decided since it's a COVID birthday that it doesn't count. So I'm going to be the same age again. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Bye, w. <laughs> Good night. Okay, so well, um, before we step down, um, I believe we have a motion on the table to adjourn. Uh, so we have, the motion was made by Councilmember Nutting, seconded by? Bangs. Councilmember Bangs. All those in favor, please say yay, or put your hand up on that. You, we need to count it officially. Right, please yay. put your hand up on the sheet. We have seven, motion passes 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Bye-bye, everybody.